going to call the uh, November 4th, 2024, Wichita Board of Education meeting in order. We appreciate you joining us tonight in, in person and online. The Wichita Public Schools will be the premier district of choice and inspire each student and staff member to thrive and become future ready within the greater community. The roll call, we all here except for one excused absence from Hazel. So there will be six voting members tonight. Uh, would you please join with me in a moment of silence? Thank you. Tonight's flag Pledge of Allegiance will be led by the East High JROTC, led by Cliff Bain, Lieutenant Colonel, United States Air Force, retired. And tonight's color guard is uh, Cadet Captain Louis Weregu, Cadet Master Sergeant Nat Doe, Cadet Captain Gabby Lopez, Cadet Airman Basic Ale Angela Palacio. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? Join with me in a round of applause for the East High JROTC. And I hope it gives you as much of a, I hope it gives you as much of a thrill as it does to me on the night before a national election to join together as a community for our Pledge of Allegiance. It means a lot to all of us and sends a chill through my spine as we do that. Uh, Latoya, uh, first uh, item, please. Good news, Good news, Kansas Can Star Recognition Program Award. As Tim and uh, Shannon come down, tonight we're going to recognize the Kansans Can Star Recognition. The Wichita Public Schools has achieved recognition in the 2024 Kansas Can Star Recognition Program demonstrating our commitment to the state's vision for education. Kansas leads the world in the success of each student. This year we have earned a bronze stars for kindergarten readiness and a copper star for our individual plan of study IPS initiative. The, pro the bronze star reflects our high quality early childhood education program, which emphasizes family engagement, a safe learning environment, a developmentally appropriate curriculum and qualified staff. The Copper Star recognizes our ongoing stu effort to ensure that all eighth graders have a five-year plan in place by May of 2025, supporting their academic readiness program. So tonight we have with us Shannon Benoit, Executive Director of uh, Curriculum and Instruction and Tim, Tim Hamlin, Executive Director of College and Career uh, Readiness. So, Tim, Shannon, it's nice to recognize you and feel free to uh, describe further uh, what this award's about. Shannon, would you like to go first? Go ahead, please. <laughs> Welcome, Shannon. Good evening, President Reasoner, Superintendent Bellerfeld, 
and board members. Thank you for recognizing us tonight. As you can imagine, this process took us quite a while to achieve um, as there were several different rubrics that we had to work through. High quality early childhood was one of the biggest pieces that we talked about and um, in our application, talking about how our pre-kindergarten and our kindergarten teachers, the instruction that they do in the classroom and the fidelity to the program that they have. We have amazing teachers in this district in early childhood, which I know you guys are, are very aware of. Um, I also want to express just my gratitude for my team. They're amazing. This team's amazing. They support um, all of our teachers and our paraprofessionals throughout pre-kindergarten and some in kindergarten. They also help to maintain the high quality standards and effective curriculum. Also with um, child assessments and just all the work that they do with behaviors and IEP support and um, just all the love that they show our kids throughout the district. So I do want to recognize them because they are an integral part of this and they did help with the eight day process that it took to complete this application. Um, so my team is Jenny Flood. She is our um, ECHO team teacher that serves on our ECHO team, which is our early childhood outcome team, which does all of our assessments for our students that come into our district. Jenny, if you want to move into the light so we can recognize you. <laughs> And then next is Erica Hartzler. Erica is one of our early childhood teaching specialists. And then Allison Harris is another early childhood teaching specialist. And Stephanie Gertz is our, our third early childhood teaching specialist. So this is a fabulous team. So just want to say thank you for all their hard work, too. Thank you. I, too, would like to thank you for taking the opportunity to recognize this uh, achievement. Um, one thing that I would like to add is that this is the fifth year in a row since the program began in 2020 that Wichita Public Schools has been awarded this, this recognition. So, and uh, joining me this evening is the young lady who I feel is, is really responsible. This is Laura Barker. She is our IPS and work-based learning specialist for Wichita Public Schools. And without her leadership, this could have probably not happened or would not have happened. So definitely want to take the opportunity to recognize Laura for all of her efforts. I do feel that this has positioned us very strongly to achieve that interim goal that all eighth graders will have a five-year plan by the end of this school year. So thank you again for letting us have this opportunity. We appreciate that. Tim, Laura, did you want to say anything? I'm done. Okay. <laughs> thank you. A woman of a thank few you. words. So. Alicia, we do have an uh, award that we want to present on behalf of Gratitude from the Kansas Can and also the Wichita Board of Education. Thank you very much. Janet, on behalf of your team. Excellent. Thank you very much, Tim and Shannon. Thank you. And I'm going to put the superintendent on the spot here real quick. We also had a late breaking uh, good news item with Fabian. If you want to stand up, he received a leadership award from the Kansas, uh, from, excuse me, Wichita Hispanic uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, for his leadership both inside and outside the school district. And we just wanted to say thank you, Fabian, for all you said. And if Kelly wants to. <laughs> We appreciate you. Yeah, I, I don't need to say anything. I didn't know Stan was going to do that. I didn't tell him about it. So <laughs> very, very uh, well, uh, well uh, deserved. So uh, Fabian's a great leader and a great uh, part of our team. Thank you. Latoya, uh, Tonya, uh, next item, please. United Teachers of Wichita. Welcome, Katie. Good evening, President Reeser, um, Vice President Albert, and uh, Superintendent Bielefeld, and distinguished board members. Um, I just wanted to say um, thank you for reminding everyone tomorrow is an important election. And um, if you're not sure in your polling place, uh, you can look on, uh, I think it's the Sedgwick County website, and pull it up there. Just put in your address. Um, and you need to bring your ID when you vote. So, um, so important that we participate in um, our civic duty. Um, I was gonna talk a little bit tonight about the DOJ settlement and making sure our teachers are supported through these big changes. Um, I think probably the first thing that I wanna talk about is I think it's really necessary that we, 
when it comes to this Department of Justice agreement that um, we remember that the code of conduct was developed to ensure that our district is addressing behavior issues consistently and equitably. Um, and, and I think that's really, really key. Um, I remember Superintendent Bielefeld saying back in, I think it was May, um, I know he had just started when this was coming about, and he had said how this is gonna make sure that, um, like we're gonna be better from this. And so I, I do think that's very, very important. Um, we keep that in mind. Uh, we've just been hearing a lot of misunderstandings from classroom teachers, and I do want to say thank you to the um, department that's working with the agreement. Um, it's Vince Evans, Melissa Zimmerman, um, Todd Sanchez, Dee Dee Strew, and Marisol. Um, they've been wonderful with answering questions for teachers, um, taking feedback for the draft code of conduct that will go in, into effect in January. So that's been, um, it's just been nice to be able to sit down and talk about these are concerns from our educators and um, that feedback's been taken. So that's been really, um, really wonderful. We really appreciate that. But I wanna make sure that as this is being rolled out to the buildings, I know it's a draft right now, but there's been some um, confusion uh, and some of our teachers are feeling like um, at times, people are like administrators are saying, um, we can't do anything because of this DOJ settlement. And so I think it's important that we discuss why this is in place and why it's so important that we have that consistency and um, how this is going to make us better. Um, I think our teachers, I know our teachers want to um, have a safe learning environment for our students, and they also want to be supported. We have students sometimes that come to school with a lot of needs, and it's really hard to meet those needs. And so um, I, I guess tonight we're just asking that we um, re-message this whole thing and make sure that we're saying um, that this is gonna probably be a challenging transition, but we're gonna remain supportive of our staff and approach these changes constructively. And we're gonna work together to make sure that our classrooms are safe, that our students are supported, and that our educators feel supported. A couple weeks ago, or maybe it was a month ago, um, somebody reached out to me about, from a news station, about the teacher shortage in Kansas. And um, we, wanna, we really wanna ensure that we keep our best teachers and that they feel supported through these hard changes. So I guess that's, what I'm asking for tonight is that um, we work together and just kind of remessage this. I know right now people are like, oh, we don't want to do this. We're not going to be able to support you with this and this and this. And I just, I think you're going to have all the support you need through this hard, challenging time of changes um, would be a better way to um, bring that to staff. So thank you. Thank you, Katie. Latona, next item, please. Service Employees International. I do not see Esau today. Is there another representative of the Service Employees Union? If not, we'll go on to public communication. Uh, and just to remind the speaker that uh, our policy is uh, to stay within three minutes and stay on your topic and uh, we cannot uh, discuss personnel matters or student information uh, in your comments. Our first speaker is Courtney Vanek. Welcome again, Courtney. Hello again. My name is Courtney Vanek, and I spoke at the last board meeting about the harmful impacts of potentially removing and relocating a group of children with disabilities from Isley. Today we face an even more devastating reality. These children might not only be removed and relocated, but also separated across different buildings. I imagine many of you in this room are parents. I want you to picture your child being told they can no longer stay at their school because there isn't enough space. Think about, think about how it would feel to know that they will be removed, relocated, and scattered from their community, only to learn that the same school in which the district claims there is no space will enroll new out-of-boundary students the following year. 
The Department of Education's Special Education Process Handbook defines placement as an educational environment rather than a specific building location, which is how this decision may be argued legally. However, I would argue that the educational environment also encompasses the relationships these, children's have, these children have spent years developing. The same handbook highlights the need to consider potential harmful effects. I attended the October 16th on-site meeting at Isley, and it's clear that a lot of planning went into this proposal, particularly regarding non-exceptional students. The district addressed challenges students face when transitioning and the sense of belonging they experience at Isley. Additionally, thoughtful consideration was given to the students who would now fall outside the new boundary, allowing them to remain at Isley to mitigate these harmful effects of relocating. There was no mention or consideration of the social emotional needs of the students in the mixed abilities program. There is not one positive social emotional benefit to removing, relocating, and separating these children. I'm not here asking for special treatment for my son. I'm here asking for equal treatment. The special education process handbook also states that placement decisions should not be based solely on factors like severity of disability, availability of space, or administrative convenience. Yet each time concerns have been raised with the district, the response has been the same hard decisions and space constraints. This isn't a hard decision. It's a harmful one and possibly a convenient one. A decision aligned with the special education handbook would be to ensure that all current Isley students can stay together. The district may meet every requirement on our children's IEPs in the name of least restrictive environment. But for these children, the true least restrictive environment is the safe, supportive home they have at Isley. Again, I am not here asking for privilege. I am advocating for equality so that the children in the mixed abilities program at Isley are not left behind in this process. Thank you, Courtney. Our next speaker is Jana Price. Absolutely. And you don't have to be concerned about time. We'll start when you speak, when you start. Welcome, Jana. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jana Price. I'm here tonight with my husband, Rodney, and son, Matthew. Matthew is 11 years old and is a fifth grader at Isley Elementary in the Mixed Abilities Program. I'm here to speak for my son because he's nonverbal but I'm also here to speak as a very concerned mother. Matthew started his education in USD 259 at Little Early Childhood Development Center before he moved to Isley. When he started at Little, he started riding the bus. To say that he loves riding the bus is an understatement. I share this story with you because it's an example of how people with Down syndrome see the good in everything. Matthew's outlook on life rubs off on other people. This isn't intentional, it is a blessing. A blessing that the USD 259 district administration doesn't see every day. A blessing that they don't live and experience every day. A blessing that will be taken away from Isley next year by moving the mixed abilities program to other schools. Lauren Hatfield said at the site meeting here, held at Isley October 16th that studies have shown that the transition from fifth to sixth grade is more difficult for students than even going from middle school to high school. Why then is, is it a good idea to move our son at the most important school transition he will have? Why can't he stay at Isley where he's been for seven years? Why should he be treated different? Why? Because he has a disability. One of the worst parts is that we won't know where he's moving until April of 2025. That is completely unacceptable. This isn't adequate time for us to tour the school, meet, 
the staff possibly shadow and see if it's a good fit for him. All children thrive on routine. I would argue that our son needs that routine more than a general ed student. He knows Isley and Isley knows him. Isley is the gold standard of inclusion. If this plan moves through as presented, think about the families that have students both in general ed and the mixed abilities classroom currently at Isley. This decision is essentially tell telling the general ed students that their sibling can't go to school anymore with them because of their disability. That is a definition of discrimination and sets a very bad precedent. That could impact both students for the rest of their life. I've heard that district administration wants USD to be the premier district in the area. That may be true for general education students, but it's not true for students with disabilities. They are failing my son and all students with disabilities with this decision. Due to that failure, we are being forced to look outside of USD 259. District administration is willing to make decisions that are good for general ed students at the expense of students with disabilities. Thank, Thank you, you, Jana. Our next speaker is Rodney Price. Good evening, President Reeser and all the board. Thank you for allowing me the time here to discuss a very important topic to me, my family, and other families at Isley Traditional Magnet that have a child with a developmental and or intellectual disability. My son Matthew attends Isley and is part of the Mixed Abilities Program. He started, as my wife said, uh, he started preschool a little early and quickly won over the hearts of his teachers and staff there. Uh, when it was time to transition to his next opportunity, we were originally assigned to another unnamed school. Not that we didn't like that school, but we had heard so many great things about Isley. And they had told us what a great school it was, and we wanted to follow a similar path. And my wife advocated, no, she fought to have Matthew at Isley, and since then, just like at Little, he has thrived. Uh, when we learned about the proposal to extend, uh, expand rather, Isley to the eighth grade level, we were elated and hopeful about his future. Uh, those hopes were dashed, though, pretty quickly when we learned that the proposal uh, to end the mixed abilities program. Um, I really believe Sandy Smith and her entire team at Isley deserve better. As my wife said, they have built a gold standard for educating our special needs children in a time where the Wichita Public Schools goal is to have every student future ready, this is a major step backward. Not only does Matthew benefit by attending Isley, but the general education students do as well. And on a regular basis, we receive pictures of Matthew interacting with his peers, whether someone's reading to him in the library or playing out on the playground. And it makes me elated to see that inclusion definitely benefits everyone. This proposal is, is rather this proposal rather is playing musical chairs with children with mixed abilities and their families who don't want to be left without a chair when the music stops. So let's do the right thing. Let's expand Isley to eighth grade, but let's preserve the mixed abilities program. When all students are included, only then will they truly be future ready. Appreciate your time. Thank you, board. We appreciate you, Rodney. Thank you. Our next speaker is David Edelston. Welcome, David. Thank you. Uh, I'm also commenting about the Isley tr Transitional Plan. I'm a Bel Air resident. All my three children have attended Isley. My son, William, is currently in the second grade, receives special needs services. If you're making notes on these comments, what I would like you to take away from mine is we still have two years where the facilities constraints don't have to dictate the movement of the special needs program. And the children, the staff, and the program itself would benefit greatly from having the time to consider and enact a better transition. Isley has and fully deserves its reputation for an excellent special needs program. The current plan is to dissolve it and move the services elsewhere. Isley spent years developing a core of excellent teachers and service providers who work incredibly well together within the school as a whole. 
Isley has made genuine efforts to build community and inclusion for children with special needs. These things don't happen overnight. They take real intention and dedication by staff members and parents. In moving the services to another location, the district will lose an excellent program. There's no guarantee that it will retain its current fantastic staff, and over the same period of time, I doubt it will restore the same program that we have today at Isley. I attended the listening session at the school a couple of weeks ago, and one of the slides listed all the positive aspects of having a K-8 through school for students, including, for many, a better sense of belonging through longer-term relationships with students and teachers, familiarity with the facility, all resulting in a better educational outcome. And I don't disagree, but unfortunately, the children with special needs won't be able to take advantage of this. Instead, not only will they lose this opportunity, they'll have to make an additional transition. As children with special needs get older, they only find it harder to make meaningful relationships with their peers as the gap between speech and physical ability widens. William is friends, uh, he, William has friends he's made since pre-K. They've learned to understand his speech and behaviors. They involve him in their friendship groups and share aspects of their lives with him. Because Will is in his local community, we see friends at the park or in the streets, and he's known by other parents who see him in the school. William knows his way around the school. He knows and understands the rules, even though he might not always obey them. William knows the staff, and the staff know him. They know how to communicate with him, and they understand his needs and how to meet them. William has a sense of belonging and value at Isley. The choice to move any student is difficult, but the current plan chooses to inflict this upon children who are the most vulnerable to it. Children with special needs need more than most consistency, routine, and familiarity. I think we have an option, really, to spend the next two years really coming up with a far better plan. I've been highly disappointed with how the district has conducted this one. And the school do, should, should have better. Students deserve better. A lot of parents have plenty of solutions they are willing to discuss. I've been incredibly frustrated with the lack of real communication on the part of the district. Thank you, David. Our final speaker tonight is Kevin Yale. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you. Um, Mr. Vuk, I appreciate our conversation earlier. I uh, do look forward to continuing that. Same with you, Ms. Bond, as well. Um, hopefully you're already aware of what was being presented to the high school students during Drug Awareness Week. Um, in case, I printed out a few slides of some of the information that was presented on the, in this PowerPoint presentation. Uh, specifically, slide one and slide three are mainly concerning to me. Uh, teaching kids how to check illegal drugs is not a good, uh, not a good plan. Uh, especially since some of these drugs are so powerful, it takes very minimal amount to induce overdose and or mental issues. Uh, same that with teaching them to teach minimal amounts or take, to take minimal amounts of hallucinogens. Uh, what point or why is it that the, the job of USD 259 educators to instruct students on how to take illegal drugs? Uh, it's just completely inappropriate. Um, Educating students to participate in, illegal, in illegal, illegal activity is just not a good plan. Regardless if it's for their safety or not, regardless of your promotion of it or not, this still shows a level of acceptance of illegal drug use in the USD 259 system. This is unacceptable. I mean, what comes next? Do we start offering safe rooms for them to use drugs? Do we start having medical personnel and providing syringes? Uh, do we hire a uh, somebody like Heisenberg from Breaking Bad and turn the chemistry labs into meth labs so that we can teach these students how to do this safely should they choose to participate. Um, these what ifs, if these what ifs sound ridiculous, I agree because they are a long step over from acceptance to actually participating in illegal activity. But if you had asked me a few weeks ago, that district leadership would make this decision without parental consent and knowledge and informed decision. I would also call that ridiculous and yet here we are. Um, all I can say is my greatest solace in this is this is my son's final year in USD 259. Um, 
had he not been, had he been younger, this, the actions taken about this action would have greatly influenced my decision as to whether or not to keep him in USD 259 or move him to another school district. Uh, I'm sure this will be, become a similar question to other parents as more learn about this. I just happened to uh, learn about it fairly quickly thanks to my son and him coming home and letting me know. I would go so far to say that, there, um, that this, these types of decisions should not rest within, solely within the district. They need to be, uh, have parental involvement. Uh, there needs to be a committee that has parents of students involved in it, probably educators and the school districts themselves that can uh, help guide these decisions. Thank you, Kevin. We appreciate Thank that. You. Thank you. Latona, next, uh, next item, please. Strategic Plan Goal 1 Graduation Rate Progress Monitoring Report. I'll now let it, uh, Kelly introduce the topic. Well, I will invite down Dr. Hatfield. Um, we have here to talk about our strategic plan and last December in 2023 you all approved the plan and our, our main three goals for student outcomes which is graduation rate um, being ready for life college and career and a sense of safety and belonging for students um, I want to walk us back through the spring though a little bit um, because I think it's important to um, to understand the full picture of why we are where we are when it comes to graduation rate. So as we were going through the, the hard process of closing schools um, and hearing from parents about the challenge of, you know, uh, longer walks to school and, and all, the, all the things that come with closing schools, we had a speaker that came a couple times and said, um, well, you're not cutting staff. Look at these numbers. And he would wave around his numbers, and he would say, "You're not cutting. You're not cutting staff. You're you're overstaffed compared to what you used to be." To which we would respond, "We know, right? What we did was we took um, the feedback from our buildings and the and the building needs assessment, and we listened to teachers and staff, and we listened to principals, and said, "What are the things that we need to keep in the district in order to achieve our goals: graduation rate, life readiness, safety, and belonging." And so. We, we, you all, made a strategic decision to maintain some of the programs that we had funded through ESSER, um, things like um, mental health supports, uh, counselors, social workers, uh, school psychologists, things like the Future Ready Advocates, uh, who are working with our students most at risk of um, uh, dropping out or not graduating because they're behind on credits. Um, and then in addition to that, um, we had uh, invested in other things, um, some night school opportunities, some alternative schooling uh, things. Um, and I hope tonight you can see that we can achieve our goals. If we are strategic um, and put our resources where they uh, most impact kids, we can achieve our goals. And we've done something uh, pretty remarkable with graduation rate uh, in closing gaps in supporting every student. You hear me talk about it all the time. Um, I think these numbers from graduation rate really show um, a desire for every student to be successful. Um, and the data is there. The data is in, uh, is in that, in the numbers. Or sorry, the data is in the numbers. The proof is in the pudding. The, the, the data shows that we, we can do things when we're, be, when we're strategic. It does take resources. Right, we, we do have to invest in order to help kids, especially some of our kids that take uh, extra when it comes to these things. Um, but I think that you can see that there was, a, there was a strategy involved, we made hard decisions, and because we were focused on our goals, and uh, our student outcomes have improved from the class of 23 to the class of 24. So I can take very little credit for that. Uh, it's really Gil and Lauren and uh, the secondary team and our principals and, and, and. It's a whole team that's done it. But um, I did want to set the stage when it comes to that. Uh, Lauren's going to share some of the, the information, uh, and then obviously we'll have time for questions. Um, take it away, Dr. Hatfield. Mm -hmm. Good evening, Board of Education. I'm Lauren Hatfield, the Assistant Superintendent for Secondary Schools. 
Um, and excited to bring you tonight a, a progress monitoring about goal number one, which is our graduation rate. Um, I do want to put out there that these numbers are not finalized. We won't get a stamp, this is the final number from the state, um, maybe by winter break, if not a little bit after. Um, but it's always within a tenth, maybe a couple tenths of a percent or so. Um, we closed the dropout graduation summary report, um, which is the big report that's open all of October. Um, we closed that at the end of October, and so we, this is the numbers that we had from there, and they're always really, really, really close. So we felt comfortable about bringing you these numbers, even though we don't have the official stamp. This is the final, this is the final number, so. <clears throat> You should have a few documents in front of you. It l I'm, it l as I'm looking at most of you, I do believe you have it. One uh, looks like this, yes, with lots of information on it. And then another one looks like this, and they are in the order. You will need them in addition to your, um, to your handout with the so slides on there, if you're curious. So a um, little bit about what the goal is and remind you what the goal is, um, because you might not have the numbers in front of you every single day uh, like the rest of us do. So goal number one is to increase our graduation rate from 79.2% to 85% by 2029. Uh, you will see that there are a few years underneath there, um, and there's a reason that those years were selected. So 2010 is on there because 2010 is the first year that the graduation rate calculation is what it is right now, right? So the class of 2029 and before, you're not comparing the same mathematical calculation. So we're not comparing apples and apples pre-2010. So that's why 2010 is on there, so you can see where our starting point was. In 2010, our district graduation rate was 63.1%. Then 2018 is on there. The reason 2018 is the next number on there is because in 2018, and some of you were members of this board, that's when the Board of Education adopted the strategic plan under Dr. Thompson that had a graduation rate goal in the strategic plan. Because prior to that, there wasn't a graduation rate goal in the strategic plan. So 2018 is on there is because that was our baseline the first time graduation rate entered into the strategic plan. The class of 2018's graduation rate was 74.0%. Okay. The next number you see there is 2020. The reason 2020 is there is because that was a blip in the radar because of some choices that had to be made in 2020. We all know school shut down in the spring of 2020. So that class of 2020, they never came back after spring break, if you'll remember this, right? So we froze everybody's grades and said, okay, your grades can't go down. They can only go up. So the classes that you need, if you don't have passing grades in them, work on those that you pass, right? So just the, the nature of that choice caused a pretty nice rise in graduation rate um, that year because the system was different in 2020. So in 2020, our graduation rate was 80.5% with an asterisk, perhaps, um, and that is the highest it's been in the calculation. 80.5% is the highest it's been in a year. And then 2023 is on there is because that's our baseline now with our new strategic plan. Uh, the class of 2023 was 79.2%. So that's why those four years are on there. It might seem haphazard because you're like, these aren't evenly spaced and all the different things, but the, each of those four years was chosen for a reason. Okay. All right. All right. Um, actually added this um, because Mr. Reeser said, hey, can you remember to talk about that how dynamic the calculation for graduation rate is? The calculation in and of itself is super simple, straight average, but it's very dynamic. Um, so let's do a little math lesson, numerator, top of the fraction, denominator, bottom of the fraction, okay? That bottom of the fraction number is what makes this calculation so dynamic. Right? It's simple. Graduates divided by how big your cohort is times 100. That's about as simple as a calculation as you can get. But what your cohort size is is super dynamic. It's determined when kids enter seventh grade. Your cohort year is determined when kids enter seventh grade. Right. So any kid 
that has entered our system that another system doesn't end up being responsible for is in that denominator. Okay? I'll talk more about that in a minute, about what do you mean that we end up being responsible for. Okay? I'm going to have an example calculation on the screen. Uh, the reason the example calculation is there, I picked 3,500 because we have approximately 3,500 kids in every cohort year. It, it ebbs and flows a little bit, but that's about what it is every year by the time we're said and done. And then I just made it so it equaled 79.2% because that's what our graduation was. Those are not real numbers from last year. This is me just creating an example calculation so that you can see. Again, the calculation is simple, but it's very dynamic. So there's a couple ways you can approach raising graduation rate. First, very simply, add graduates, right? The numerator gets bigger. Your graduation rate goes up. It's very simple. So my second calculation, example calculation, again, these are not real. This is me just fake numbers, okay? So the second calculation, let's pretend we added 100 graduates. So we added 100 kids to the numerator. Now, what was 79.2% is now 82.1% because we added 100 kids that graduated. 100 more kids got a diploma, the number changes. Okay? The other way to attack the graduation rate calculation is to change the denominator. And here's what I mean. For example, Timmy's, Timmy comes here in ninth grade. Timmy enrolls at North High. Timmy moves to Texas. Means Timmy should come out of that denominator because he's not our responsibility anymore because Timmy moved to Texas. He's no longer Wichita Public Schools' responsibility. We don't have to track down whether or not Timmy got a diploma in Texas. He should drop off of the denominator. So when Timmy moves, our denominator should go from 3,500 to 3,499. You see what I'm saying? Okay. But if we don't do a good job with record keeping or as good a job as we could, we keep kids in the denominator that shouldn't be there anymore. Right? So I'll get the Timmy situation. He says, hey, I'm actually going to move to Topeka. Okay. So we exit him with an exit code that says he goes to Topeka. Then, two weeks later, we get a records request from Texas. If Timmy goes to Topeka but doesn't enroll in Topeka, he's still our responsibility and he stays in our denominator. But we got a records request from Texas. If we don't go fix the exit, he stays in our denominator and counts against us even though he moved to Texas because our data didn't keep up and wasn't clean enough. So when I say adjust the cohort, appropriately adjust the cohort to make sure you're scrubbing the data and cleaning the data so that the kids who are in the denominator should be in the denominator. Do you see what I'm saying there? So there's a few things. Moving out of state is one. Um, if a kid goes to a home school that's not accredited or any other non-accredited private school, they stay in our denominator. They stay in our denominator. Um, if a kid moves in state but doesn't get picked up by somebody else in state, they stay in our denominator. One of the things we have to do when we look at it is Oh, we thought Timmy moved to Topeka. And then we go, look, Timmy did move to Topeka. They accidentally, they didn't realize he came from us. They enrolled him with a new state ID, so the state system isn't tracking that this Timmy and this Timmy are the same kid. And so we have to go say, uh-uh-uh-uh, Timmy's over there. Take him out of our denominator. Does that make sense? That's another, that's another common one. Um, unfortunately, we do have students pass away. Right? If we don't exit them correctly, they could be in our denominator if, we don't, if we're not exiting them correctly. Um, so that records keeping related to who should and who shouldn't be in your cohort, cohort is what I mean when I'm talking about adjust the cohort size. We don't want to take anybody out that should be there, but let's make sure the kids that are there are supposed to be there. Yep. And then the best option is to do both. What if we add graduates and we clean up the cohort so that the kids are supposed to be there, right? It's, an, it's a 100 kid adjustment every way. So right in the, in the dark blue, add graduates. We added 100 graduates. We went to 82.1%. In the teal, we subtracted 100 kids from the cohort. And we went to 81.5%. If you add graduates and you subtract from the cohort and you come from both directions, all of a sudden it's 84.4. So again, super simple calculation. 
but how dynamic that cohort is makes a very substantial difference in where you end up, and you got to attack from both directions. And I would just add, um, with the with the cohorts, managing that cohort is a significant challenge because of our size, right? When I was in a smaller district, we knew every single kid. So we knew if Lauren left, we knew, okay, take Lauren out. We know where she went. And keep in mind, this class of 24, what were they doing their freshman year when the cohort started? They, they were at home. They were at home. And so the record keeping of that and that big drop we had in enrollment also created some of these bookkeeping issues. So we're going back to fall of 2020 and chasing these kids down from then until now. And not by we, I mean <laughs> Lauren and her team. I'm, these guys did an amazing job of tracking that down. So we want to count every kid we should be counting, but we also want the best data we can um, to make sure that, that the record keeping is accurate. All right. So now, do you remember a couple of slides ago? I guess it was only one slide ago. What was last year's number? 79.2, right? Remember, that's where we were. 79.2 is where we were in 2023. All right. So in 2024, we really got after it. And like I said, we approach this from both directions. How do we add graduates and how do we clean up our cohort data so that we have as, many, as much accuracy as possible in that denominator? Um, and we relentlessly pursued both of those pieces. And we got to 84.3% which is a 5.1% increase from one year to the next. It is the largest jump we've ever taken in one year, and it is by far the highest graduation rate Wichita Public Schools has ever had. Um, just soak <laughs> that in for a second. Um, <laughs> um, to understand, like Kelly said with our size, to understand what this means, that's about 178 more kids that graduated in the class of 24, 24 than we had the year before that. Um, every, again, rough math, because that denominator is always changing, every three and a half kids is a tenth of a percent. And we talked over and over and over again. We're fighting for tenths of a percent. We're fighting to change kids' lives. Find them, find a way for them to graduate, okay? find a way to fix the data so that it's correct, right? So that our number is really our number. Because for how long have we underreported the number potentially because we haven't done maintenance on the cohort part? And we've been doing some maintenance, but when I tell you we turned over rocks, I don't think there's any rocks left to turn over in that class. Um, I would like to give a shout, shout out to uh, Sonia Bauman and Mary Ellen Gibson and Scott Dellinger, who didn't matter how many crazy emails I sent them, never told me I was nuts to my face. Um, and just kept digging and kept digging and kept digging and kept digging and when I ran out of things for them to dig they found more things to dig on um, they are a huge huge part of finding all of that because like Kelly said th it goes back four years so and these kids started high school remote so there's a lot of things that happened in that remote year that there's not a human in that high school that necessarily knows because they didn't lay eyes on them until they were in second semester of high school. Um, and it's a <coughs> lot harder to know the kids when they're not in front of you um, every single day. So um, we pulled in, in um, August, we, I said, give me a list of every kid who was supposed to graduate last year who didn't. And we gave it to the schools and man, did they go find them. Because you have until September 30th, this is why this data takes so long, you have until September 30th to graduate and you're considered on time. So the class of 2024, you're on time until September 30th of, of that year. So there are schools that went and found kids and said, you are so close. You only have a class left. Come, come to school and finish. We're not letting you slip through the cracks when you're this close. Um, I'm just so, so impressed with all of the work that our system did um, to get there. Um, if you're curious about some subgroup data, that's what this is. So thank you to Strategic Communications for putting this together. Um, this should be familiar to you. You've seen it before. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about some subgroup data, uh, but this has more specifics and other years if you want to compare uh, year to year on it. <clears throat> 
So let's talk about. Let's see here. Let's do it this way. It's not going. You can change graduation rate, but I can't change this PowerPoint slide, so that tells you a little bit. Kay. All right, so let's dive into some specifics about subgroups. So this is our race and gender subgroups. Okay. Um, there's only one subgroup we don't have enough kids to count. Here's what I mean. The state says if you have 10 or more kids in a subgroup, it counts. Um, there is one subgroup, um, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander. We don't have 10, we don't have 10 kids in it. So that subgroup doesn't count for us. They give us a number, but it's not reported in any of the, the stuff because we just don't have enough kids in that subgroup. Um, so these are all of our race and gender subgroups that we have enough kids in. What do the asterisks mean? The asterisk means that subgroup has its highest ever graduation rate. So that's what that means. Um, if you look across there, our race graduation gap is almost gone, which is amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Now, our girls are still outpacing our boys, and it's not close, to be honest. But our boys and our girls both in many, many, many subgroups both had their highest ever, right? So the, the boys made a huge leap. But they didn't catch the girls because the girls made a huge leap too. Um, and so now the, the gap that we have to go after is the gender, is the gender gap. Now, this not an excuse, but a reality. That gender gap persists across education across the United States. The, the girls are outpacing the boys um, in all the subgroups. Yeah. So that shows that data. <coughs> then I wanted to just put a little pretend first place trophy on here because there are four subgroups that had other subgroups than the ones you just saw that also had their highest rate ever. And it's astonishing to compare their rate from the class of 2024 to what their previous high graduation rate was. So I just wanted to call these four subgroups out specifically. Um, so our students with free lunch had an 82% graduation rate, all of our students with, with free lunch. Their previous high was 77.5, and that was in 2022. Um, our virtual students had 72.1% graduation rate. Uh, their previous high was 70.4, which was last year. Our students with disabilities, um, I've heard a rumor that if it ever gets to 100%, somebody's getting a car. <laughs> um, I heard that rumor. Um, but there's uh, a lot of folks in our Student Support Services Department who have done a lot of work. Um, they actually went and found kids that had dropped out and said, can you come to AMAC and finish a couple of classes um, and ran it? Um, they had a, someone from their team that took time out of their day every day to check kids in and help them work on classes because they'd already said, I'm out, I'm not doing this anymore. And they went and found them and brought them back in and it paid off. Um, they were at 81.9. Their previous high was 76.6, and that was in 2022. And then our foster care graduation rate, um, their previous high was 53.6, and that was in 2018. Um, and they're all the way at 75.9. So I just want to call special attention to those four um, because they weren't on the previous slide, and they made a lot of substantial growth, which is super important. All right. Let's look at individual schools. Um, you can see your class of 23 and your class of 24 um, comparison as well as percent growth. Every single school went up, um, which is excellent. Every single school went up in their graduation rate. What do the asterisks mean? It's their highest graduation rate ever. There's a lot of asterisks on that page. Um, East and EIA had their highest graduation rate ever last year and then this year again. So they've had their highest graduation rate ever two years in a row, which is great. There's only three on there that don't, um, and I will say this. So Chester Lewis, um, that's their highest since we separated EIA and Chester Lewis the way we have them separate now. 
Um, and it's, it, it's their highest and it's not close. Also a massive substantial jump from 23 to 24 for Chester Lewis. Um, heights, it's very close to their highest ever. Um, and their highest ever, it's their second highest ever, their highest ever was in 2018. Um, so they're, they're knocking on the door. And then south, it's their second highest ever. And their highest ever was in 2020. And we already went through why that one might have been as high as it was. Um, so they're there, they're super close to having an asterisk on their name, even if they don't have an asterisk on their name. And it's easy to look at the numbers and just be like, oh, okay. Um, and I, uh, I'm moved by numbers, but most people aren't. I realize that I am strange. Um, and so I did ask some of the schools if they would share some stories that the kids said it's okay to share um, with all of you about how decisions that we've made and programs that we have have impacted actual real students' lives. And I don't usually read from notes because I don't like it. I like to kind of freewheel a little bit up here, um, but I don't want to mess up any details. So I'm actually going to read from my paper um, for, for these. And so what, when I say we relentlessly pursued every kid, here's some examples of what I'm talking about. Um, at Sowers, they have a night school. Um, if you're like, what are all these programs you're talking about? That's what this is. We could be here for 478 hours if I tried to talk through all these programs with you. So this is just for your, for your reference. Um, later, because it talks about some of the programs, and I'm going to throw out some names, and you're going to be like, instead of getting caught up in the, what's the difference between, look at this, because otherwise this is going to turn into a what, is, what programs do we have presentation and not a graduation rate presentation. Okay. So Sowers is a night school. They took that list of here's all the kids that didn't graduate, who's close, who could we find, who can we get, and they had a young man who was showing up. His name was Anthony. And he was coming to night school and he was working and he was going to get finished. And then one day, his friend came to pick him up from night school. And his friend was also on the list, but they hadn't been able to get a hold of him. So they said, hey, Christian, <coughs> if you're going to come pick up Anthony every day, you get here and you graduate too. And Christian said, well, if Anthony can, I can. And they got two more graduates before September 30th, because they have a night program, and because they knew about those kids, and they said, you're so close. You can finish, what can we do to help you? There's Ramel, who was released from JDF, JDF custody with minimal credits. He was supposed to go to Gateway, and they were honest. And they said, look, I don't even know if it's possible, because you are so credit deficient. But they enrolled him in the GAP program, and he got to work. I got him a haircut, because if you look good, feel good, play good, right, those things. Got him a haircut. He was taken off. He got a little distracted, because some court dates were coming up, and they said, focus on what you can control. Focus on what you can control. And Ramel graduated. After being released from JDF custody, and he works at Goodwill now, and is a productive citizen, young man, in Wichita. <clears throat> There's Adrian, who was teetering on the edge, not quite credit deficient, but woo, played it close joined the basketball team and had a basketball coach that said, no, you're going to stay on this side of the line. And he did. There's Blanca and Jose from South who needed to make up a couple of courses before they were allowed to go to the Future Ready Center. And they wanted to go to the Future Ready Center so bad, one in manufacturing and one in healthcare, that they said, well, okay. And they completed the courses that they needed to make up so that they could go to the Future Ready Center. And not only did they graduate, but they got some post-secondary assets and some credentials, and now they're working with well-paying jobs in Wichita. There's Deshaun, who bounced from home to home, but found a trusted adult in a counseling small group and made it across the stage. There's Thomas, who lost his mom as a junior and fell off the wagon, but found his way to Chester Lewis and was able to graduate. There's Braden, who was always on track, but was able to afford to go to college because of a fine arts scholarship because of those, those programs and those adults. There's our high school student mentors, our future ready advocates, and many more who went and found kids and said, we will believe in you until you believe in yourself, and that's how we get kids across the stage. I could tell stories like this all day long. I had to cultivate some of them, um, and thank you for the principals for, for sharing those. Because it's different 
when you hear, and think about how many different program things you heard. Because one of them was athletics. Is athletics a program? Yes, it is, right? There's gap. You heard gap. You heard flex. You heard Chester Lewis. You heard some of the other. You heard fine arts. That's a program, right? So how are we going to do this? How are we, they were joking with me at DLT the other day, and they said, I'm going to need you to quit raising that graduation rate because what are we going to do next? I said, we're going to go get 85%. I, di I didn't say that. You didn't, you, you didn't. But there were some others that were like, I'm going to need that number to quit change because every, I'm obsessed. And every day I would check the DGSR. Even my own team was like, you don't have to check every day. Yeah, I do. I have to check every day. Every day in the month of October. Um, and I would give an update and they were like, okay, stop. Uh, because what are we going to do next? And what we're going to do next is we're going to go get 85% because that's what the goal says. And then after we get 85%, we're going to go get 86%. And we're going to keep relentlessly pursuing every single kid because a high school diploma can change a kid's life. And sometimes we know that before they know that. And so we have to do everything in our power to get them across the stage. It makes Wichita better. It makes us better. And it can change kids' lives. But there are three things really, truly that stand out of how this was possible. One is innovative programming. You have a list of programming. And programming doesn't just mean of alternative options. Programming also means how are we keeping and attracting other kids, right? We have Future Ready Centers. That's a program. We have athletics. That's a type of program. We have amazing fine arts. I can't tell you how many Sean Chastain could. I can't tell you how many years in a row Wichita Public Schools has been named one of the great places for music education. It's absolutely astounding. Um, we have ECA programs. We have IB pro All of these things are innovative programs. And if we stop innovating, we're in trouble. So we have to keep finding. We have to keep going. Does that work? Does that not work? oh, that works, do we need to divest to invest over here? That's what Kelly was talking about earlier. Um, two, data quality improvements. Um, that's that adjusting that cohort. We are too big to leave things to chance. And so we're already working a ton on how do we keep from having to clean up as much data as we had to clean up in future years because we can clean it every month instead of waiting until October after the kids graduate and be like, what happened to that kid? Or I thought, like, that's too many years. You got to do it as you go. And we need to develop systemic checks and balances in that so that we can do a better job. And then the third one, and this is really where we have the most gr room to grow, I believe, is what are our early intervention? We have so many amazing alternative options but we need to really start honing in on what are some of those early intervention things so that we don't need the alternative pieces as much. Not that they're not good. Our, I will put our alternative options up against anybody's, but I'd like to use them a little less. And I'd like to do more early intervention and keep a kid from having to hit a few safety nets on the way down, because that can be painful. Um, and I mean, really overall, relentlessly pursuing every kid. How many rabbit trails can we run down? Well, we should run down about 3,500 of them every year because that's how many kids are in that cohort. Um, so before I take questions, I do just want to, I, I do just want to say thank you. Every human connected to Wichita Public Schools <coughs> should, I can't do cartwheels, but they should do cartwheels, high five with friends. They pulled off something amazing. 5.1% in a year? That's insane. That percent growth is insane. So nutrition services, the folks that come every day and make sure our kids are fed, they should be celebrating because they're part of that number. Um, our guest staff who make sure that kids have a teacher when their teacher is sick and taking care of themselves like they should, they should be celebrating. Our community partners, how many mentoring community partner groups do we have that help us find kids so that they don't slip through the cracks? they should be celebrating our facilities programs that even then when we call them 478 times and say it is too hot in this school and Luke wants to screen our phone calls at that point <laughs> they should be celebrating because we need kids to be able to get to school and we need them to learn um, our student support services group our counselors our mental health folk like they should be celebrating our paras our teachers our bus drivers who find a way to get kids to school every single day Addie and her team should be celebrating because when we say, hey, we think it's this and not this, they're always willing to play ball on that conversation and try to figure out what's the best. Um, of course, our parents 
should be celebrating because we can't do this without them. Our kids should be celebrating because none of this would happen if they didn't say, oh, you're right. I can graduate because we can't drag them kicking and screaming across the stage. At some point, they have to willingly walk across the stage themselves. Um, our administrators for being willing to go after numbers and not go, there's no way we can reach that goal. Yes, there is. And then all of you. Because like Kelly said earlier, without the choices you make, we don't do that. There's no way. It's not possible. So I just want to say thank you because that's an insane, insane number. And I knew I was going to do this because I even told them, I said, I don't read from my notes, but I think I'm going to be so overwhelmingly proud of everyone that I'm going to break. And I did, darn it. <laughs> so, um, but I would love to take your questions um, and celebrate with you in whatever form that means. But if you make me do a cartwheel out here, <laughs> it's not going to go well. So, Thank you so much. Kathy? Wow. Come on. Wow. <coughs> I feel your emotion and your passion and your shock and awe. That was a wonderful presentation. You explained it very well with the denominator and the, cause I, I'm not a math person. I got exempted at Wichita State from taking math. <laughs> I had to beg. I do have a few questions. You said that early intervention mm -hmm. is the area that you feel that we could grow the yeah. most in. At this current time, what are we doing for early intervention? Yeah, so we've, we've developed, particularly in math and in English, some options for our students who we know they're not quite ready for Algebra 1 or they're not qu quite ready. I mean, they have to take English 1, but they need some additional support. Um, so we have some very specific interventions for math and English, um, but interventions in high school look very different than interventions in the rest of our system. Um, and a lot of that intervention is honestly understanding the high school system, understanding that you have to come to school, understanding that your grades matter, because it's really hard to convince a ninth grader of that. It's really hard to convince a ninth grader of that because that hasn't exactly been their reality their whole life. And then why am I gonna just believe this random adult who's telling me that my grades matter right now? Um, so some of those early intervention pieces of get involved, be involved, um, and we, we have enough research to know what indicators are gonna say you might be somebody that gets off track. Like I need to know you might get off track before you're off track because if I'm constantly reacting, and then I've, no, so we're, we're working on some credits on track metrics that are a little more dynamic and in real time so that I can look at, okay, which kids are on track? Ooh, which kids are on track based on the classes they're in right now? If they pass them all, which <coughs> kids are on track based off the grades they have in the classes they have right now? Because if you're in this group is on track, but then you're not in this group is on track, that means your grades right now are probably doing something I don't like. So can I intervene now instead of waiting until you fail the class and then having to repeat? I like that. I'm, I'm a preventative type yeah. of believer as yeah. well as a reactant. Um, so Tell me more about adjusting this cohort. Yeah. How far are you from completely getting it cleaned up to being able to be on top of it? Yeah, um, probably about three years, to be totally honest. Okay, and is that doing it monthly? Is that doing yeah, it weekly? Yeah, so you can, only f you can only adjust what's happened in the last fiscal year. So you can't, you can't go back four years. Um, I mean, you can in some circumstances, but they have to be very unique. Um, so we need to do a better job of every, so now the principals every month get a list. Here's every kid that's exited your building in the last month, okay. and here's what exit code they have. And educating folks on which, e which exit codes count against us, which exit codes don't count against us. Is that exit code right, or is that exit code wrong? What records do we have that maybe that exit code is? Because sometimes we know the code's wrong, but we don't have the proof to prove to the state, hey, two years ago, we messed that up. Can we fix that? No. You don't have proof. So um, really developing those systems. And like we had a meeting with our registrars and counselors a couple weeks ago to tell them how important they are in this process. Because sometimes you don't, I'm just putting in exit codes, right? You don't realize how it 
impacts the larger system. So be able to help them understand, no, what you're doing is super, super important. Um, I think all of that goes to cleaning up that cohort. But really, truly, I mean, will we ever be 100% on top of it? No way. No. It's, we're too, way too big, and there's not enough checks and balances in the world for that. But until it's cleaner, probably about three years, because it's going to take us that amount of time to flush out this side and bring all the new processes in with those kids. But if we could only go back a year, the fiscal year, why would it take that long? Because there are certain kids that you can clean up in a special circumstance, but you can't clean up, you can't clean all of them up. Okay. Um, so it depends on why they're coded as a dropout. Mm. Um, okay. What you can submit. And there could have been human error. There's a lot of in yeah, the codes. I mean, Every human makes an error. Sure. I've made like 17 mistakes today <laughs> since I've been sitting up here. Um, so we'll never get rid of human error. Correct. So it will never be 100%. But we can create systems and processes and to, to mitigate the human error to the greatest extent possible. And that's really what we're, we're working on. And that's going to take time and training. And I would add, too, the, the proof part of it is a challenge all across the state. Mm -hmm. So you, you may know this kid ended up here. But if you don't have any any documentation to back that up, you can't. We can't just go in and change codes. Right. So we have to have proof to back it up. Correct. So, but that that, it's it's not unique to us. It's big scale because we're so big. Right. But every state or every every school district around the state has that that issue. That I know this kid moved to Oklahoma. He told everyone he moved to Oklahoma. We don't have any proof that the kid moved to Oklahoma. So, he's marked whereabouts unknown. Or, or wow. And so. And that hurts us. Because mm -hmm. right. whereabouts yeah. unknown means they count against you. And he's still part of us. And he's still part of the cohort. Because, yeah. Well, I celebrate you tonight. Thank you, Dr. Hatfield. Really, thank you for, for everything that you're doing to clean it up. That's what we need to do. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Knock. Thank you, Dr. Hatfield, for the presentation. Uh, a lot, for sure, worth uh, celebrating. Kathy actually asked a lot of the questions. Um, I was going to ask. Uh, I do have two other questions, though. Um, so, how did the standards reference grading affect the graduation rates? So, our high schools aren't. It is teacher choice. Okay. Some of them want to use that. Some of them don't want to use that. But it's not a mandate in any way, shape, or form. So, um, I'm not sure there's a. I don't think you can answer the question when there's not a systemic approach to it at the high school level because the teachers do get to choose okay. at the high school level. And then in terms of the uh, uh, credit recovery, academic recovery, um, can you tell me more about uh, you know, how the standard, the rigor, uh, or just like the educational quality, how that compares to you know, more traditional? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So there, most of them use a program called Edgenuity um, that is aligned to the standards. So learning services has to go through there and say, okay, here's our English 1 standards. Yep, Edgenuity, here's the English 1 standards. And the kids have to watch lessons and take assessments and pass um, before they can move on. That is the major platform for the credit recovery. Now, they can, right, we can award credit based on mastery. So if I take a pretest for unit one in biology, and I know all about the parts of the cell, and I can take a test and tell you I know all about the parts of the cell, then I don't have to redo all the lessons about the parts of the cell, because I already know about the parts of the cell. So that does allow kids to churn through some of those recovery things faster, because they can demonstrate on the pre-assessment that they already have some mastery of content, and then it allows them to skip over pieces, you've already demonstrated mastery on that. You don't need to show me again that you know that you know how to do that. Um, but then the other ones where y you know the parts of the cell, but you don't know anything about how genetics works. Um, so then they have to re they have to really. I mean, they're going to spend more time. Um, it takes typically about 40 hours of coursework in a recovery credit course to to finish it. So um, depending on if that's the only thing you're doing, could you get through that pretty fast? Yeah, it is. Um, but the fact of the matter is that's probably not the only thing you're doing. So, uh, but yeah, it's usually 40-ish 40, 40 
hours total. And I would just throw out um, personal experience. You know, I had a son who did uh, EIA in middle school, um, and ingenuity is not a joke. I mean, it is, and he didn't test out of, I mean, he didn't pa pass any of the tests to get to quiz out of any of the stuff. So um, it was, it was, it, it's not super engaging. So it takes work for the kid, but um, it, it isn't low rigor by any means. Um, we also have ELO. We also have um, we have kids that will just get traditional credit, retaking a course, in th first block or whatever. We have some of that too. So, yeah, it's not all ingenuity, right? There are some of them. Uh, to be honest, um, the edu the ingenuity success rates in math are not very high, right? Math on a computer, right? Probably probably not going to grow great. And so most of those kids are actually recovering that credit via summer school or, hey, you're in Algebra 1 and Geometry in person right now taking, taking those classes. So um, it really depends on, on what the program is. But yeah, every, everything is, is checked to be standards aligned. But we can award credit based on mastery. It's not based on time with your butt in a seat. Um, and so once a kid demonstrates mastery, then we can award them credit for, for that. Uh, third question, sorry. Um, uh, you kind of touched up on this, uh, talking with uh, Kathy about the uh, early intervention. I could definitely feel your passion. Um, so, you know, question for both Kelly and uh, you, just uh, any, any more details on like what that looks like? Uh, or, or just like, you know, uh, plans for the immediate future with that? So I'll, I'll start an answer and you'll probably finish it. But um, one of the strategies, one of the things that we know about graduation is that Algebra 1 is, can be a gatekeeper class, and if you can't pass Algebra 1, it's very hard to graduate. So the next presentation that we're going to do about the interim goals, that's one of our interim goals, is that eighth grade math goal. Um, and we haven't, we haven't been focused on that full bore like we've been focused on graduation rates, so there's room to improve there. Uh, but that's one, I would say, one of the things on early intervention, along with I don't know where it's at right now, but I know you're working with the team on some uh, credit deficient tracking methods and able to see all of that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, there's, without being a total nerd, um, there's a principal supervisor's monthly report and what sort of data are they consuming um, based off of who might be on that early intervention list so you can see that, um, which is super and super important. But I really think really investing in freshmen and I think a big key for us is, so we had, we used ESSER dollars to pay for senior mentors. They were called senior mentors, right? Senior liaisons. And they really focused on seniors. Well, we wrote a grant and got it for all of the schools that we applied for it to change those from senior liaisons to high school student mentors. Because are we actually going to get more out of them if we, yes, they can do seniors, but I actually need you to go mentor these freshmen so those freshmen don't ever get in that boat that those seniors got. Now, can you full-fledged take the switch all at one time? No, because you don't want to leave your seniors over there on an island, but we're pulling, we're, we're taking that senior liaison model and pulling it down to say, how can we start switching that from top heavy to bottom heavy for the freshmen um, so that we need less alternative options as they go through the system because we caught them earlier. And one other thing I'd throw out there that might might feel like connecting a couple dots that are that are not near each other, um, but Lawrence mentioned it several times that when kids are connected with something in the school, they're more likely to graduate, whether that's JROTC or journalism or Future Ready Center or whatever. Um, so having that five-year plan in eighth grade where I'm thinking about the courses I'm going to take and then hopefully getting them into a course that they're interested in, that you know, the schedule spins and, oh, sorry, you didn't get in automotive, even though that's really your passion, to do a better job of getting those kids in a class that motivates them, especially in their freshman year, because freshman year don't typically have a lot of electives. So uh, ensuring that, um, that may seem not like an early intervention strategy, but it is. It, if kids have a reason to show up to school and something they like, they're much more likely uh, to do the things they may not like as much. So Absolutely. I think an another... Um, early intervention in that same vein is in strategic plan goal number two, the interim goal in high school is that they will have a post-secondary asset check-in every month. Um, well, that's all about graduation and it's and segmented out by 
month and what's appropriate and what the juniors are talking about that month is not the same as what the freshmen are talking about that month um, to help kids understand what are these other things that might give me the tie, like Kelly mentioned, and the reason to come to school other than Algebra 1? Because while it pains me to admit, Algebra 1 is probably not the reason a lot of kids are choosing to come to school every day. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nock. Melody? Lauren, this is so rich. Everything that you've shared with us. It, I mean, the excitement that y you showed more pride and, and, you know, just, oh my gosh, we did this. But there's also excitement that's built into all of this because it is so very connected. I remember when we had our retreat, the board retreat, and then leadership was there. And it was there that we talked about how we wanted to be able to get out to the public, um, our strategic goals, and how we would actually be able to hardwire what it is that we are trying to do, what it is that the community helped us to uh, create uh, in terms of goals for this district and then to actually go about the business of implementing, of, of putting these goals into action and that we would share this information with our public at our board meetings. And we're doing exactly <coughs> that. And I am so hopeful that the public is watching this um, because I'm, I'm just looking at uh, there's this um, chronological timeline that was given to us about um, month to month exactly what would be happening. And so we're at uh, the point of graduation. And I mean, my goodness, if we can't crow about five points, I, I don't know. I don't, something's wrong, you know, if we don't get excited about this and say, we're doing some things right. There's a lot that we, ha we haven't left it on the table, but there's a lot that we still need to do. I, I get it, I understand. But this is something that we can be proudful of, and I think I said it at our last, um, on Friday, when I was talking about how we have to create a new narrative about our district. Our district is, our district is moving in the right direction. We are putting into place some things that I think can truly change uh, how we educate students. And the, 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 the way that you were, and everyone, as you named, everyone from the custodial staff all the way to, to our administrators, to the d district leadership, and everyone in between made this happen. It wasn't just one department. It was a district uh, feat that made this happen. And I'm, I just, you know, I, I'm, I'm, very, um, I'm very empowered and energized by this one goal that we have met. We have interim goals that will get us even further to the 85.2 or 85. 84.3. 84. Well, where we want to go, though. 85. 85. 85. We're going to have to change that after we hit it. Yeah, because I think we're going to hit that. I th yeah. We're going to hit that fairly, really quickly. So having said that, um, I still want to take a moment. I know you lifted up and highlighted some areas. When we're talking about these four sectors, free lunch, mm -hmm. students with mm -hmm. disabilities, virtual, and mm -hmm. foster students, foster uh, students, I was gonna say kids, but they are students. Um, the, the growth and the, the trajectory that they're on is uh, phenomenal. I say this to say that all boats, how does it say, lift? Rising all, tide. Rising tides, tide. yeah. raises all boats. And so when you think about it from, not from an economic perspective, because I remember that's really, it was coined for an economic, vision, but when you look at what it is that we're trying to do and the, the disparities, the challenges that we have in our district, and I'm not only talking about racial disparities, I'm talking about gender, I'm talking about academic, I, I'm talking about when you look at these four quarters or um, buckets that we're, we're, we uh, discussed, 
if we, when we lift and focus and target on everything accordingly, we'll lift the whole district. And so when, when I see, and I remember also at our um, board retreat, I was the one, I was one that said, I want to focus on African American male graduation rates. Boom. Mm -hmm. Here we are. I mean, we're talking about being able to almost erase that disparity, that gap that was so glaring. And that's not to say that some buildings, and, and even when I look at it from building to building, those rates have gone, the graduation rates have increased. Um, but yes, I'm so proud, filled of the work that's been done by all of these different organizations and entities. Uh, I know I saw Dr. Polite that was here for a, a bit. He's no longer uh, with us right now. But that was but one organization that I know has helped when we look at the increase and in the, the closing of that gap for um, African American graduates. But uh, yeah, rising tides, we've got to be able to focus on uh, all of our different groups and because that is what's going to lift this whole district. So job well done. Um, I'm just eager to see, you know, the next report that we have as well as the interim goals that we're working on. Um, yeah. I better start tempering expectations because they're not going to be a 5.1% well, jump every I'm, year. I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm just saying. Um, it's okay. I, I, no, it's, I'll um, make it. I, I'm, I'm very excited too. I, um, my husband is not in education and he doesn't get it. So like I was trying to explain how exciting this is to him and he was like, congratulations. Yeah. Like, yeah. And so I think all the emotion came out tonight because I'm like, I'm around people who understand right mm -hmm. now. Um, how big of a deal this is. Um, and like you said, it's a, it's a true team effort. Dr. Polite sent me a very nice email the other day when I sent DLT the numbers and I said, don't leave you and your team out of this either. Because oh. um, I think about every time he would send us a picture when he was at JDF with another graduate. Absolutely. Yeah. And every, no. every three and a half kids, 0.1%, relentlessly pursue every kid. And I it takes all the humans yeah, to yeah. relentlessly pursue every kid. So, and when we're talking about, I know I could go on and on, and I'm going to attempt to keep this short, but this is so, it's so very, very important. So when we talk about early intervention and, and we talk about the need, that that's where we have the biggest area of grow, the ability to grow in. Um, we also know, and you've already identified it, that our alternative programs are phenomenal. And that, that's an area that we can grow. No, we, I mean, it's not. It's not what we want to see happen, but we need them. We need them simply because life happens. And so, um, yeah, I, I just, I, it's, it's, it's important for me to lift the unsung that are out there. And that's gonna be the Chester I. Lewis's, and oh gosh, I just have it, I, I'm gonna do this and I'll be done. Chester I. Lewis South, Southeast and Sowers. When I look at the growth rate, Everyone grew, as you said. I mean, every we have Northeast Magnet that's at 98 percent. I mean, we have Northwest that's at 93. We have East High that's now at 88, and then we have the growth that's in these um, buildings. And I'm talking about Chester I. Lewis more specifically and Sowers. Most people don't even think about yeah. students that attend and graduate from Sowers, but to get the growth that we saw there. To go back and pull those students, that's something. And we have to keep doing it because those, all of those students, as you would say, Superintendent, they're all our students. Right. Everyone. Every student. Every student. Yep. So thank you. I'm done. Thank, no, thank you, Melody. I just wanted to give a small example of I just recently uh, went out with the uh, nutrition service drivers uh, as they were delivering meals and I had an opportunity, to, we were all standing there in our jeans, uh, in our work clothes. I actually worked and helped push the food trucks around. Uh, I, I was excited for it, and, but, but I had a chance to talk to them and I said, I said, listen, I'm gonna steal some thunder here uh, this coming Tuesday or Monday, we're going to announce some really great <clears throat> uh, 
uh, graduation rate numbers. And I want you to know, and these are all, uh, you know, they're not administrators, they're, they're workers. Uh, and that's where my background is. And I said, sometimes you forget what we're doing this for. And I told them some of the th numbers I thought we were gonna get with uh, graduation rates. And I said, you had a role in this. And they all stopped and applauded. And so when I saw Gil starting to lead the applause here, that's very appropriate because it's something we should be excited <laughs> about. Uh, 5.1, trying to move anything, 5.1, is nearly impossible. And then I have the one small advantage of, I, re, I, I was fearful when I first got on the board around uh, 2018, 17, 17, 18, uh, we had in our strategic plan to increase our high school graduation rates. There was concern when we were heading into this last one, it didn't appear to me that maybe we were gonna make it a high priority again. And I was very concerned about that because there's one, if there's one thing in our site, in our society, that is a major anchor around your neck is if you have to admit on a job application or anything else in, in society that you did not graduate high school, that is one, there's, a many, there's many anchors that can be put around people's necks. But that's one anchor that we, if we stay committed to working on this goal, that's one anchor that we can help remove. <clears throat> and I also just wanna, and so I, am, I appreciate your emotion on that, Lauren, 100%, because I feel, I feel that as well. I tell you, I also want to just put out a little, I, and I hesitate to do this because I don't want to point out one particular group, but we had a 2.5% increase with African American females. And that is one of the lowest increases we have. And so compare that to uh, American Indian males with a 32.6% percent increase but I point out their small increase because our female African-American students get it they understand the importance of graduation the reason why they're only at a 2.5 is because they have never fallen below 81.5 in the last eight years you see special education males up 19.2 percent this is a commitment across the board, but I just wanted to also point out that our African American female students have led the way on our graduation rates for many years now, and we need to tap into their attitude about what it takes to be a successful student, and I appreciate them, and I just wanted to point that out. Diane? Dr. Hatfield, thank you for the presentation tonight. Um, I appreciate you walking us through the numbers because oftentimes we hear, we just want you to be accurate. We want accurate information and, and to walk through very detailed examples of how this is actually more accurate than what we have had in the past was very compelling this evening. And so thank you for those examples um, because oftentimes I have conversations with people and it's like, we're gonna be honest with the data. It's the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I can say from my experience of being on this board that I have seen a real commitment from uh, the district leadership team all the way down to be honest and accurate with the information that we have. And I know that that is not always the reputation out in the public, but I can attest personally that I have witnessed that and tonight you've displayed that as well. And so thank you for that commitment. Um, I love the the tagline of relentlessly pursue every student because we also recognize even though we're we're dealing with numbers here that these actually represent individuals that that have a purpose and a destiny calling um that they're to fulfill in life and so to give them this other step forward and it's not and i correct that it's not to give them a step they have earned this step it's not a graduation diploma and name only this represents what they have earned uh, to this point in their life. And so it's not, it's not a gift to them, it is something that they've earned. Um, and so I just wanna thank the district for, for remaining committed to being honest with the data no matter where it leads. 
Um, and so with that, I, I do want to thank my fellow board members for asking really good questions tonight. Um, and we've had, a, we've had a, a dynamic discussion this evening, so I don't have any other questions to add. I just want to say thank you to, to all the staff, to everybody that is involved with this from the biggest details down to the smallest details. We, we, are, we are forever grateful for the dedication that you guys have to the individual students that we have so thank I, you I don't know how Kelly's going to arrange the district every human in the district like giving themselves a standing ovation but somehow <laughs> some way um, yeah. every 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 human needs to give themselves a standing ovation because absolutely. every human's part of it so. absolutely thank you Diane thank you Julie I don't really have anything further to say um, you know everyone has made great comments here to uh, applaud your work, but I do want to just be on the team to also say how much I appreciate your work and how we are definitely celebrating with you this great achievement. Parting a walk away statistic, I was telling Stan this the other day, um, if they get to senior year with us, we can get nine, we got 91% of the kids who were seniors last year graduated. So if we can get them to senior year, we can find a way. Um, we just got to find a way to get them to senior year. So, <clears throat> thank you, great Lauren. job. Thank you. <laughs> Latona, next item, please. Strategic plan goal one: elementary and middle school interim goal data. Kelly. All right. So, still hanging out in goal number one. You'll recall the overall student outcome we're looking for in goal number one is graduation but it takes a lot of steps to get there and we want some academic uh, preparedness to uh, come along the way. So um, this is our update for fall screener and middle school math and a little bit of state assessment sprinkled in, in too. So uh, thank you to Amanda Sharshall and Holly Ingram and I'll pass it off to you guys. Welcome Holly and Amanda. Good evening, Superintendent Bielefeld, President Reeser, Vice President Albert and the board. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, I'm Holly Ingram, Executive Director of Secondary Curriculum Instruction, and Amanda Sharshall is my better half. Uh, don't tell my husband I said that. Uh, she's the Executive Director of Elementary Curriculum Instruction, and um, it's a really cool segue coming after Dr. Hatfield's um, presentation tonight because she talked about that early intervention piece. Um, and often in elementary and middle school, we don't get to see where they end up. Um, but we really, um, being able to see these graduation rate numbers is exciting for all our staff, as she pointed out. Um, so we're here to give you an update related to the elementary and middle school goals around graduation rate um, and some changes that we're going to make on these interim goals. Um, so as you know, last spring when we were finalizing our strategic plan, um, our interim goals for elementary and middle were both around decreasing that percentage of students scoring level one. So in elementary, decreasing the percentage of students scoring a one on the reading Kansas State assessment from 47.6 to 45.6 in third grade. And then in middle school, decreasing that percentage of students scoring one on the math assessment in eighth grade from 67.3 to 65%. So those were the interim goals um, when we were finalizing the strategic plan. However, there's been some changes related to the state assessment for our state assessments that students will take this upcoming spring in 2025 that the Kansas State Department of Education is making. So overall, the changes, um, the big piece of that is changing the cut score. So there's a new assessment. There are bullets up on the screen for you. So updated blueprints, there's new items, new cut scores will be set next summer, new performance level descriptors, they're increasing the use of block-based items. Block-based items mean I give you a graph or I give you a reading passage, and there's multiple questions around that, and then reducing just a standalone writing item. So overall um, changes to the assessment. So as a result, we really cannot compare spring of 24 scores to spring of 25 scores because they're different assessments, and those cut scores won't be set until the summer, so then hopefully by spring of 26, we can begin looking at that comparison and come back to the state assessment. 
So as Holly mentioned the changes, this um, required us to take a look at both our elementary interim and our middle school strategic plan um, interim goals. So we have chosen to continue to look at decreasing the percentage of students who are not proficient um, or not meeting performance, performance benchmarks, but we are going to switch to utilizing a reading for third grade and a math for eighth grade. I do wanna point out these percentages right now are different for elementary and middle. So elementary third graders were not required to take a reading last year. So our baseline of 56.5% of kids not proficient is from fall of this year. And we're working towards 53% by May of 2025. Um, I was with principals at Principal PLC um, the past couple weeks, and that is two kids per building. If we can make sure two third graders at every one of our elementary sites moves into proficiency, we will make that. And for middle, that is a spring to spring. So they did assess a math in eighth grade last year with a 63% of students not proficient and we're working towards 59.5% by May. So what did this shift mean for elementary teachers, coaches, um, leaders? Very little actually. Uh, we will continue to use our proficiency scales to plan dynamic lessons. We are directly aligned to state, the standards through those, state standards through those scales. And in the interim, we are going to measure progress using an assessment that has a question and response format that is substantially similar to state standardized assessments, which is a reading. We'd already started the work last year of aligning the um, skills on an A reading report back to our proficiency scales or standards with some pilot buildings. Um, and that work was beneficial because now it's required for second through fifth graders to take this assessment. So it is given three times a year instead of once a year, which also um, bodes well for being able to look at that data and really improve instruction more frequently um, than we get state assessment reports. There is an individual skills reporting um, um, report available. So what that does is it takes a student and it says they are meeting standards or not meeting standards in four different areas, including reading informational and reading fictional, as well as foundational skills and language. It's a familiar assessment, which was a bonus for us. We have given it in the past in, a, in our upper grade levels, and it's administered whole group. So when you think about giving an assessment to your students, one-on-one -on -one is pretty high lift for our teachers, but a whole group administration is a pretty good get. So we'll continue to support our teachers, coaches, and leaders in how to use those reports to inform both their core instruction, what they're doing in language comprehension, as well as their reading intervention. Um, I do wanna point out also that um, as we move forward with A reading, we look forward to providing some um, reporting measures for you more frequently than we did state assessments. We were also asked to give a fall screener performance update for you guys. So you have seen this graph from me for four years now. So four years of fall data. I do want to point out a typo in the kindergarten letter sound fluency really quick before we get started. In the green text that says 53.1%, underneath it, instead of 3.8 percentage points, it's 5.3. So this table is four falls worth of data on screeners that we assess our um, elementary students. We are getting familiar as a board with LNF and LSF, that's letter name, and letter sound fluency, as well as word seg. You'll see first grade nonsense word fluency, and then second through fifth grade CBMR, which is an oral reading fluency assessment. We do believe it's important to look at year over year growth on the same assessment given in the same window, because this tells us information on instructional impact on student outcomes. Specifically, how is our professional learning going? Do we have the appropriate curriculum and routines? How are teachers teaching? And what processes do we have for school improvement? So the incremental gains um, have added up to some larger gains you can see in that far right-hand column. And we do attribute this to our teachers. Um, they are hard workers. Never met a teacher who didn't want their students to succeed. Um, our coaches, our leaders, really focusing their efforts on the science of reading and how we help our students learn to read which you all got to experience last week when you went to Harry Street, Hyde, Spate, and OK to visit some really hardworking primary teachers. And we're excited about that last column. We've seen some pretty significant gains over the years. So as we shift to middle school, um, as the superintendent pointed out earlier, math hasn't really been a focus for us. 
Um, and if you remember, as we were setting the strategic plan goals last spring, one important piece was having a measure specific to middle school um, because they kind of felt left out and we weren't really being as intentional um, as we could have been monitoring that data. Um, so shifting from the math state assessment to math, um, the A math screener is not a huge shift in what the data will tell us. It'll actually give us a little more data three times a year as Amanda mentioned, similar to the A reading. It's the screener we have been using for quite some time, but I don't know that we've been using it to the greatest extent that we could with our teachers, with our leaders, and having those data conversations. What are we doing? Um, we're using it to decide who is an intervention, who's not, but then how do we help it better inform our instruction? How do we intervene um, early? As Dr. Hatfield was talking, this is one of those strategies that can help us that transition from middle school to high school, and are we sending them um, as well prepared as we can? Um, so it's gonna give us, similar to what Amanda said, the individual skills report, so we know that on each student. We've been giving it so it's familiar to our teachers and it's administered whole group, but I think we can get better about how we use the data more frequently um, with our teachers and our leaders as we monitor that. Because we all know what we monitor and what we expect, we see growth in that. So I think that intentional focus that you all set for us last spring is gonna see some growth there. Um, so beginning similar strategies, supporting our teachers and coaches and leaders and how we use that. Um, we also have a new product we're using that's actually funded by the Kansas State Department of Education. It's called Math IXL. Um, we're using that in our intervention programs. We started using it on a smaller scale last year, um, got really positive feedback, so we expanded that to all intervention in middle school. It gives us some really good standard aligned data. So the A math, similar to A reading, it's an adaptive test. So they take about 30 to 60 questions. If I get the first one correct, it's gonna adapt, go a little harder. If I get that question incorrect, and it's measuring six to um, eight different skills across based on grade level. So the A math I take as a fifth grader is different than A math as an eighth grader, so forth. Um, so then that data then places me into intervention and then the math I excel gives us even more data on what our instruction should be. Um, so utilizing both of those pieces gives us more flexibility, gives us more real time <laughs> data um, to be able to intervene with students in that middle school um, math intervention time. Um, so we haven't been sharing math data, so don't cringe when you look at the screen. Um, but as Diane said earlier, we wanna be honest and accurate. So while we haven't been giving a math data, we did want you to see where we've been. And this hasn't been a focus for us. So it's not all pretty, like Amanda's had all this pretty green. It's not all green, there's a little bit of green, but we haven't been focused on it. So this is where we've been in the a math 6th, 7th, and 8th. Um, but you can see one, a big reason why we wanna focus on eighth, not just because of the shift um, to high school, but specifically we have a lot of growth to do there as well. Um, but we'll still be monitoring all grade levels as we look at that with middle school. My green helps your green. Her green helps my green, that's true. So that's a lot of data in a short amount of time. What questions can we answer for you? I, I I had a, a call from a constituent recently, and I think I gave them the right answer, but it reminded me to uh, maybe ask this at a public meeting. Could you please explain the difference between FastBridge and our state assessment? Yes, FastBridge is a screener. So um, you've heard me liken that to going to the doctor for your physical and them saying, wait, something might be wrong here. We need blood work, we need x-rays, we might even need an MRI or to see a specialist. It's gonna give us that red flag that something is wrong in that student's trajectory towards meeting benchmarks. Um, it's very grade level specific and you can give very discrete skills. So like in kindergarten, letter name, letter sound, two very um, independent skills. And our state assessment covers a broad range of standards. Um, it is not given to all students, whereas Fast Bridge Screener, we have measures for K through eight um, and state assessments three through five, six through eight and 10th grade. That's, uh, that is perfect, and the, the, the assurance I tried to give them is that we are not, with FastBridge, we are not just waiting till the state assessments come in and then we see some s scores that we're not happy with, that we're using FastBridge in the fall and the spring 
in order to improve the state assessment scores and also not just one time assessment score i mean we're it's really an incremental let's have them improve throughout the school year is that correct yeah it's administered three times but i think the other difference between a screener and a state assessment is the progress monitoring capabilities of fastbridge so for many assessments you can intervene and assess in between screener windows as well so a kindergartner who might not have all their letter names in the fall could be checked in on multiple times before they even hit winter okay that's not a function of a state assessment they don't have that right function okay thank you perfect Perfect. Another thing on the uh, screeners is their nationally normed scores. So we don't run into, unless they totally change or we switch assessment companies, what we're running into with the state assessment. So they're totally rewriting. So now we have to wait for new cut scores. Like their, their adjustments are so fine tuned because it's nationally normed. So their scores we can use and predict pretty easily where state assessment you're changing. Now we have to pause and wait. So that's another difference. I appreciate you making that part of the public record. Diane? Going back to state assessments, if we go back to slide three, if I understand this accurately, we are going to give students the state assessment in the spring with a new state assessment, and then the cut scores are determined in the summer? Mm -hmm. Yes. So our Can you explain how that makes sense? So we will give all our students the state assessment as we've always done. So okay. same grade levels are assessed every spring. But a different test, a yes, new test. Yes, a different test. So after that testing is all complete, then the special assessment people, I think they go to some uni or at some university called KU, um, they look at all of the scores and then from those scores and all their statistical analysis by really smart data people, they set what's what's a one, what's a two, what's a three, what's a four, what cut scores determine those performance level indicators. So they have to wait until all the assessments are done, look at all the data, analyze all the data, set the cut scores. Then I believe they've told us we should have our state assessment scores back by like September or October of fall of 25. So we'll know how we did, but we won't really be able to compare to 24 scores. Does that make sense? We'll okay. still know. We'll know here's what we got. Ones, twos, threes, fours, just like before. Okay. But we won't be comparing the same test score. So we kind of want to wait till uh, spring of 26 to then make that comparison. Gotcha. So, and I, I jump in. Um, one thing I learned today, um, I don't know what all the, the range of numbers is, but a 300 is the bottom end of, the, of a three on the state assessment. So what the state has done since 2017, I think, when, or 2016, whenever these, this test has been in place, is they track what is the ultimate outcome for that kid. So what do you get on your state assessment, and then where do you end up? And what they found is a lot of kids that get a 280, which is a two, graduate from college, right? So, so because what we're trying to do is predict college and career readiness. That's, mm -hmm. if, you, if you see the form, it has the different, um, you know, low level of readiness for college and career. Are you ready or you're beyond ready? I'm summarizing, but it's, it's close to that. Um, but essentially what, what they found is that we are having Kansas graduates with certain scores that are successful in post-secondary. Um, so that's part of how they might adjust those scores um, to, to more accurately reflect reality that a student with a, and I'm making up 280, but that's just an example. A student with a 280 actually it should be in a three because they are ready for college and career. And we know that because they've proven that they are by going to college and graduating. So um, again, smarter people than me are figuring all that out, but that is one of the factors that they're using. They have a long history of knowing where do these kids end up, um, these students upon grad, adults, I guess, not kids, but after graduation, how successful are they? And they can, they can use that to create the ranges so that parents have, really, as a parent, you're looking for, is my kid on track, right? Is my mm -hmm. kid on track? And so we want to make sure that's accurate um, as we're telling parents about that. Thank you. Um, on slide four, we use the word benchmark. Can you explain what that means exactly in that definition? Yeah, so on the screener, not the same, but similar. It has four different um, scoring categories. So college pathway, low risk, meaning so college pathway, hey, based on this, we have no concerns. 
low risk, you're at grade level, but we should not not look at you, but right now the risk of you not doing well is low, then some risk and high risk. Some risk and high risk is what we then look at in tier two or tier three intervention because you're below benchmark. So benchmark is basically that cutoff point in the middle of um, not being at risk, needing additional intervention. Okay. And then uh, on slide eight, I'm looking at, uh, we use the word district proficient. Mm -hmm. Is that going to be the same measurement? So the numbers are kind of inverted. So the goal is not the decrease the percent not proficient. This is the percent proficient, okay. if that makes so sense. So just the opposite. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Very good. And then you also mentioned um, some of the processes that we have for school improvement. And can you expand on that a little bit? For elementary, middle, or both? Either one. I think just in general, people want to know, what are we doing? Here's the data. What are we doing about it? Are we doing something different, or are we doing the same thing over and over again? I think people are interested in, in what are we doing to address the problems that we see and seek to improve. Yeah. I was just looking at my school's school improvement plans as I've been listening tonight, um, and I think it starts with our data, collecting accurate data first, um, and then looking at what is that data telling us so that we can build school-level goals that um, align to the strategic plan goals. So for instance, if I'm supporting a building and they're still looking at some pretty low proficiency and those word recognition skills, um, we're going to set goals there first because we know to improve our school, we have to start there. Um, so each building is responsible for creating a school improvement plan that's data-based. Um, they work with their teachers through the assessment protocol on how to collect that data. Um, they measure their goals. So just like you've heard, maybe WIGs and lead measures and scoreboards, they're doing that at elementary as well. Yeah, um, one intentional thing we're doing in middle school math, because there's been a lot of new, is uh, providing additional support for teachers on the new intervention program. We have it next week, I believe. So they got started, they're using it. So now, now that you're in it, what questions, how are things doing? Um, so since there's a lot of new there, it's just making sure we provide that continual support for both teachers. Um, and then what we're also doing, um, Amanda mentioned like the uh, principal PLC, we're doing that both in elementary and secondary. So really doing deep dives with our leaders around all of these data pieces. So then how is my school improvement plan influencing this data? So then they can go back because what may be working over at this school, then I can hear that from my colleague and take that to um, my school as well. Or, hey, I'm struggling with this. What are you guys doing? So really trying to increase that collaboration around the strategies that are working. Um, I think for us in middle school, it's first really monitoring and looking at the data to then identify where the strategies are. They're ahead of us in elementary since reading's been that goal for a while. Um, so I hope as we start to come and share this, there's gonna be a little more green on that middle school math uh, screen soon, so. I think the simple um, way to remember school improvement for us is plan. Uh, plan, study, plan, do, check, act. There's, you know, those plan, things. Do, Continuous improvement, check. right? Um, so I'm, I don't ever stop improving. Like I get the next set of data and I look at what I'm doing and is it working? And if it's not, I adjust. And if it is, I keep going and I add another goal. And, and one, one other thing, just to uh, MTSS, I don't know, you mentioned that much, but we talked a little bit about tier two and tier three kids, but that's another, mm -hmm. is that in every school for a school improvement plan? Is that, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, um, MTSS has just been part of our system for a very long time, and um, I would consider Wichita Public Schools trailblazers with MTSS in the state of Kansas. We often go to places to learn about MTSS and realize that we, we're doing all the things that the schools around us are just now learning to do with their tiered systems of support. Um, and every single school uses MTSS as their model for school improvement, uh, part of school improvement as well. If, if I can, I'll share a, a little experience I had last week at a school I was able to be part of some staff meetings, two different staff meetings at a K-8 school, and I was able to sit there and witness them really share, they were talking about specific students, what intervention programs they needed, and then also like, hey, if we change this schedule in the morning, then we can align some interventions for these students so they don't miss out on certain things, but then they can get the interventions that they need. It was a very encouraging meeting to witness um, in, in two different ways. And so I, I just want to share that with the public that 
these aren't just numbers that we're hearing from the board table. Like these are, I'm seeing them in classrooms. I'm seeing them with principals leading in meetings. I'm seeing the teachers organize and structure their days, their weeks, and their time around specific students to give them the, to meet the needs that they have for, for their academic needs. And so I just, I just want to say I was very encouraged last week to witness those meetings. So it really is coming from the top all the way down into the classroom these numbers, these goals, these metrics and measurements. And so I just want to say thank you to the staff that, that it was very encouraging to witness that. So thank you. Thank you, Diane. Kathy? You're getting a load full tonight, aren't you? <laughs> thank you for being transparent with these numbers. It would be so easy for you to just tweak a number to make it look good to us and to the community and I really want to tell you that I appreciate being honest with us and open to the community to give us that honest baseline. Like, no, it's not all good. I mean, Dr. Hatfield gave us, wow, and here we got to follow her up. But you know what? We are here to encourage you to do the plans that you have set out to do. I have no doubt that we will see all green numbers. Uh, I mean, I really believe that because I believe in you so I know that it's going to happen I would like to share about my experience at OK Elementary last week I was so impressed with the kindergarten and the first grade teacher um, Superintendent Bielefeld was with me and I I was engaged they had those students their attention was they didn't even know we they knew we were there because they saw us come in but after they got used to us, those children, and they knew, they knew the sounds, they knew the letters, they knew their special letter for the day, and I was so hopeful. I'm so grateful that we have letters. It, that's what I learned on, well, we called it phonics back then, but it, it, I really believe we are gonna, we're turning a corner, mm -hmm. um, because the foundation of our K through five is changing and I really appreciate again that transparency and that honesty thank you thank you Kathy Melody thanks uh, thank you for the presentation and the update um, you mentioned um, reports more often which reports and how often will we be receiving them I am not sure how often we'll be in front of you, but we will have three times a year where we get fresh screener data on both A math and A reading, which so is not the same as state assessments. That's once. Oh, say it's, okay, so it's the same as, isn't that what we receive with FastBridge? Mm -hmm. A reading and A math are FastBridge assessments. Yes. Okay, so that we're already doing that. It's not going to change. Um, and then I thought I heard also that each building creates a plan. Is it? An improvement what is the plan mm -hmm. um, so part of our accreditation process mm -hmm. um, is having a school improvement plan um, superintendent Bielefeld and deputy superintendent Alvarez are wise in that we don't have a strategic plan and a school improvement plan that are different okay. so they're one in the same for us in Wichita public schools so you all set the big goals then we have the interim goals and then buildings get their individual data and those are their um, wildly important goals and then they create action steps um, to meet those interim goals so it all funnels all the way down from our strategic plan down to the building and then they might identify what is the action that's going to move this um, interim goal around each of the goals and I've been in a couple of buildings where they're actually posted. Mm -hmm. um, would we say that at the elementary level, is that more for a teaching staff and or a support staff? It's not as much for, let's say, the kindergartner or the first or second grader. Is it, is it reminders that this is what we're here for, this is what we're doing, this is how we're gonna get here? I think we all play the game a little bit different when we see the score. Mm -hmm. um, I have supported buildings and grade level teams that have found very innovative ways of putting data up around their building that not only maintains the dignity of the student, 
but motivates everybody in that space to make that number move. Mm -hmm. um, so some buildings are using, um, you know, bubble gum machines and pop pieces of popcorn or off to the races, different ways to show their data and how they're doing um, in ways that all staff members are reminded this is where we're headed and all kids can see where they're at. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was it for me, thank you. Thank you, Melody. Knock. Is the data dashboard uh, posted yet? So, um, so if you go to the website, you can see, I don't have the, the sheet in front of me, but you can see the three main goals. With the website transition, they've ended up on three different pages. I don't know if you guys have seen that since it got transitioned, but it isn't much of a dashboard anymore because you kind of have to click through things. So um, I've not shared that with the team to get that cleaned up. But um, yeah, it'll look like it did before okay. as far as the dashboard goes. So. Okay. And then for uh, A math and A reading, is that administered like on a uh, like a school issued device or is it like pencil and paper? They're on their individual devices in middle school because they're all, okay, and in elementary. So yeah, the student um, logs into their portal, they click on FastBridge, and then it gives them whatever the assigned screener is. So the teachers don't actually have to um, assign those. So it's set up based on their grade level. And so this is something that wouldn't necessarily be able to be in pen, like pencil and paper, like you know, if a parent like, wanted to consent out or, or to what, sorry, you said? Like, you know, consent, like out of taking, like the, like the students taking the test, or, or the screener on the, like a school issued device. There's no capability of a reading or a math because they're adaptive to be given paper pencil. Okay. Um, so a, a parent, I'm assuming this is where you're headed, a parent who might not want their student to take the assessment on the device, that's the only way to take that assessment is on the device. Okay. And then um, IXL, uh, you said that was a, was that a, district decision or was that like a like a KSDE like statewide mandate or recommendation so KSDE is uh, paying for it currently we okay. hope they continue if they're listening um, but we as a district opted in to use it so they offered it um, to districts but we didn't have they didn't mandate it so um, we started using it last year um, felt like it met what we had previously used and our teachers actually liked it better. Um, so we did shift to using it. So it was a win-win of saving some dollars and um, using something the teachers liked. Right, thank you, that's all. Thank you, Nock. Julie? I had the same question Nock had relative to whether the dashboard was on the district website. So I actually went today and started searching and I had a really hard time finding it. <laughs> but, but if you're interested, knock or anybody else, um, when you go to usd259.org, um, there's a, a box to choose that says learn about Wichita Public Schools. And then from there, you pick Wichita Public Schools Strategic Plan and then you'll come to student success outcomes, our data dashboard. So, uh, so it, it's there, I found it. But the other thing, as I was searching for it, and as I looked at a whole lot of different choices trying to figure out what it was, data and transparency is just all over our district website. Um, you know, all of this data that you guys are talking about and information about all of the different uh, ways that we uh, test kids and a link to um, the state assessments that, and what they publish, I mean, everything is there. <laughs> so, I mean, I just, you know, for board members, for the public, um, uh, we, um, there, there is just transparency <laughs> and data just all over the place if, if you want to go look for it. But anyway, that's a, that was a segue because of your question, Nock. But as far as um, you ladies are concerned, I think we can celebrate with you also because you're showing vast improvement here as well. Um, my, my one question is relative to the math performance and your admission that 
but we don't have the improvements here because we haven't been focusing. Mm -hmm. um, what is the plan to kind of refocus and also, I mean, I know you can't do everything all the time, but mm -hmm. uh, what is the plan to refocus and also work on getting those, that improvement? Um, a simple strategy, unless you haven't been around teenagers, is getting them to take it seriously. So because we as adults haven't been focused on it, I can't sit here in front of you and say we have created the best testing environment for our kids. I'm not saying that's any fault of anyone. It's not the teacher's fault. We just haven't said this is a really important data point, so we need you to go in there and do your best. So that's like the low-hanging fruit. Is that going to get us everything? No. But might it get us some? Yes, because if you haven't been around kids these ages, it's really easy to just click through, right? So really telling them the importance of it so that they take it seriously. So that's one step as we focus on it, share it with our leaders, share it with the teachers so that they can say, hey, Moses, when you go in and take that, because my eighth grader last year probably didn't do this as seriously as his mother would like him to, um, <laughs> we want you to do your best so we know what skills you have and what skills you don't have. So that's step one. Um, and then also just really supporting the teachers and our buildings as we look at data, then what is working with those kids, what is not, um, and getting that early intervention piece in place. So you guys are going to first refocus yourselves, yes. and then yep. that will then yep. move the focus down to that level as well. So, yes. And can I say, Julie, that's exactly what we did in elementary to start with. We started with our leaders and our coaches before we ever came to our teachers. Um, and I think that strategy pays off to make sure that everyone's on board before we ask our teachers to take one more thing on, give them the why, tell them that we're doing it alongside with you, we're here to learn with you. I think that's a, um, it's a good strategy. Yeah. Yeah. So Very good, thank you. I, I would throw out a couple more things because I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. Um, if you think back to last month and Sean's presentation about vacancies, um, this, this data is fall to fall. So these seventh graders that tested haven't been in seventh grade math very long, right? This really reflects what did they learn all last year in sixth grade in some ways. So making sure we have highly qualified teachers that are, that are trained, that are, that are able to have the resources they need is definitely a piece of this bigger picture too. People do this, right? Like the human beings, Lauren kept talking about the human beings. Without great human beings, none of this works. So that, that's a piece of it. Um, the other thing I wanted to share, if you go back to slide six, the other, this one, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Amanda, but I think if you look at fall 21, second grade, that 34.1%, and then you go diagonal down, so those second graders then the next fall become third graders, 44.8, they become fourth graders, 48%, and now they're fifth graders, there's 52. So that's a cohorted group, and it's a different way of looking, and if you look kind of down in those diagonals, you see we're doing a lot of really good things for that too. So do the fourth grade teachers need to keep improving fourth grade instruction? Of course they do. But are we seeing year to year improvement for those groups of kids? And we have mobility and we have kids in and out of the district, so it's not exactly the same group of kids. But overall, um, when you draw that diagonal line down, um, we're seeing improvements that way too, um, which, which is also important. So. Um, and the last thing I want to say, just because I have the mic, um, Lauren misspoke, and she was texting me that she said the, seventh, the, the cohort for graduation is determined at seventh grade, it's determined at ninth grade, and she just misspoke. So I wanted to make sure we're on the record that the first day of freshman year is when the cohort starts. Okay, they're part of, they're part of dropout rate, but not part of graduation rate. But anyway, so, yeah, so, all right. To, to Kelly's point, though, and I haven't looked recently, and I think this is true. For the first time in quite some time, we have, we have no or had no secondary math vacancies. And that, I don't know when the last time that was true in Wichita Public Schools. So that should also make a huge difference. So pointing that out, but like the fact that there's no secondary math vacancies is like rare. I'm not sure if that's ever been true in my time in Wichita Public Schools. Great job. Thank you very much. Is it the will of the board to take a 10 minute break before the consent agenda or would you like to power through on the consent agenda and we're not that far away from the executive session? Okay.
Latona, next item, please. Consent. Kathy, any consent items to pull? E5. That's Isley, that's Isley K through eight transition plan and boundary change. Is that the only one, Kathy? Okay. Julie, any consent items to pull? None to pull. Um, Melody? Yes. Yeah, I can't hear. Oh, thank you. Uh, I thought I was just talking to <laughs> Stan. But <laughs> okay, so the financials are, are here, and um, that's under consent. Yes. I do have some questions, so I would pull. Okay, the resolutions or the appointment of trustees oh, the, or the treasury warrants. Well, what I was looking at was actual on page two of ten, three of ten, five of ten, and nine of ten. So where? Let me see where I'm at. And it might have been. And Melody, I'll, I'll circle Just back around circle to you. Circle back, Okay, yeah. Diane? Nothing to pull? I have no consent items to pull. Knock? I was gonna pull uh, E5. Uh, Kathy already pulled that out, okay. nothing else to pull. Excellent. Melody? Um, let me look again, so. Is the are budgeted items in here? No, the, okay, so all I the financials have... are the change since we have a new chief financial yeah. officer. No, I don't. Nothing to pull. I've... Okay, all right. I move that we adopt the consent agenda, except for the Isley K through eight transition plan and boundary change. I'll second. Moved by Stan and seconded by Diane. You may vote. There you go, you got it. Motion carries 6 0. Um, E5, the Isley K through 8 transition plan and boundary change. Uh, Kelly, if you want to introduce that and introduce uh, Fabian or. Yeah. 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 Um, so we'll, we'll open up for questions, but we, uh, yeah. Fabian had offered to, to share a short presentation. You guys have seen most of this, but the public. Um, can see what the what the impact of the changes and, and good evening um, first uh, thank you um, one thing I do want to clarify and, and I appreciate all the parents that came up and, and, and spoke and advocated um, tonight's board decision is strictly boundary related um, again we want to make clear that programming changes including special education and some of those pieces are really administrative decisions um, and so again, so uh, even last year when, when we went through the building closures, again, the, the placement of the, the movement of programs are really administrative decisions. The, the vote that's tonight is simply to make Isley a K-8 and to build a boundary for Isley um, that, that reflects the K-8 designation, ba basically opening up middle school boundary. Kathy, do you have any questions? And knock, I'll get to you well, second. Don't. Well, yes. I I really want to make sure that if I choose to vote yes for this, that these parents that got up and spoke tonight are not going to be affected. Their student will not be affected. I want reassurance of that. 
I'm compelled to open up discussion with the board um, after hearing from the last meeting and from tonight's meeting about these mixed ability students. And isn't there another way that we could consider or think about to keep these students there if the families want to choose to keep them there? Are we taking mixed abilities completely out of Isley? It, I, I need understanding here. If you could help me, Mr. Superintendent. Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, Lauren has done a, I don't know if you want to come speak to this or not, but um, she did a good job at the community meeting about explaining that the, the square footage in the classrooms at Isley won't be enough if we add sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. In August, you guys passed a facility master plan that included changing K Isley to a K-8. So that's the direction as a team we've been headed. We actually have um, at Isley, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go off memory, but I'm pretty sure, um, visually impaired, we have a PBS, uh, three PBS, uh, positive behavior support classrooms. Um, we have interrelated students, we have mixed ability students, we have pre-K students. So the plan uh, that we're bringing forward uh, as administrative, uh, as the administrators is to move some of those programs, not all of those programs. So we are not discriminating against everyone who's disabled. Right, the right. Disabled students will still go to school at Isley. We just didn't have the capacity to, to continue to have all of those programs there. And just like we did last year with um, Park and Clark and some of those programs, we had to relocate programs to another, another place. Um, Hadley had a PBS program or two. We had, we had to move those to other locations. So, so help me understand, are the students and the teachers going to be able to move over as a group and stay with one another? Where are, are they going to be split? That's yet to be determined. I don't, I don't know that we know the answer to okay, that. Okay, so if we have to move this program away from Isley, which will affect some of our families, is there another option that we might be able to have to allow them to move together with, with their instructors, their teachers? If the program's not gonna be there, then the teacher's not gonna be there. So can we find a way so that maybe it'll, the change will be a little bit easier on them? The, the way that, as far as the location of where it's going, I, I, I don't have any knowledge of that tonight on November 4th. Um, some of the staff might, but I, I don't. We, we go through this process every year. So special ed families that have a student in a specialized program like this, every year before August or before April 1st, get a letter that notifies them of where the location of their services is going to be. So we do this. We, we do this okay. every year. Okay. Um, when we closed schools, and Fabian, jump in if I'm wrong on this, but I believe that we did not require any staff to go to a certain place to follow a program. So when we moved Hadley's PBS program, um, and maybe that's a bad example because we kind of changed change paths No, I hear what PBS. you're saying, but right. Anyway, we did not say you, you have, have to, to go, go with that program to this new school. Correct. We allowed staff to have that choice. Okay. So my guess would be we would say, take the same approach with staff at this in this situation and say you have the opportunity, uh, you'll have a job for sure. Now if that staff wanted to stay together, we would honor that, but we aren't going to force them to stay together. And, and we don't know at this point in time where these families will be relocated to? Do we have any idea? I, I, I'm no. not prepared for that question okay. tonight. Okay. Had I known you were going to ask that, I might have been able to, to no, have some okay. information. It just, but It came as yeah. we converse. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, well, I'm, maybe it's the empathy in me, and I'm not looking at it intellectually. But I have a lot of um, empathy for these families. And after I heard them speak tonight, I can only imagine if I were in that spot, how I might feel. And I guess they're, they're sitting here looking at me right now because I'm talking. And you know, whatever happens, USD 259 will take care of your children. Well, I, I know, I know, change is hard. Change is so hard. We've gone through this in March. and. Um, I, I know as a parent with two small children at one time, to make those changes, it's very difficult. And, um, but I do know that this, this district will take care of the families and the students. Um, so if I vote for this tonight, 
I am actually voting that these, well, I've already voted for no, it. I've no. I've already voted for it. No, okay. but, but hold on. The, the location of services is not a board decision. Right. It's an administration right. decision. Does that make I, sense? I, so I you aren't voting that. tonight. No, I'm voting for the boundary change. Right. You are not voting to move mixed And this is going to make the K through 8 work, which right. I am um, advocating for. Right. Yes. Okay. Right. Thank you. Knock. You know, personally, I would like to see Isley uh, K through 8 have a mixed abilities uh, program. Um, my question is more so just like the actual boundary changes as well, but um, I do have some questions too about uh, uh, the mixed, ab mixed abilities uh, programming. So in theory, if we, so for clarification, regardless of the bond issues passing, uh, tonight's decision will be to turn Isley to a K through eight. That's true. Yes. And then sh if the bond issue passed and if it was a will of the board, uh, there could be a mixed abilities program at uh, Isley, you know, contingent upon, you know, if we were to mandate, you know, like a building expansion for it. If you guys uh, wanted to amend the plan, I mean, that, that's not, there, there are some site improvements that are part of uh, the bond issue for Isley, but that, that specifically isn't one of them. Um, more like parking and driveways and some things like that. Okay. Um, if you guys wanted to amend the plan, by all means, that, that would be, that would be, you know, something we could look at. And then how soon could we make that decision? Well, I mean, it's your plan, <laughs> right, as a board. If that's, I, I think we'd want to probably do some due mm -hmm. diligence. Um, we already have four different specialized special ed programs there. So, you know, I, I, I don't want to commit to, to that being our recommendation, but our recommendation doesn't matter if you guys say that's what we need to do. Um, we would unless we're gonna, which I think the ship has sailed on the $450 million number. So we'd have to look at what we're not doing um, in other parts of the bond issue in order to make that happen. But I, I don't think the cost would be huge. Um, I don't know where at the site we would do that. I mean, I don't have, again, not prepared for that question. I've, that's the first I've heard anyone ask that, so. Yeah, no, I just, yeah, I, yeah it just came up. Um, the question I had for more some boundary changes, um, so how would the boundary changes affect like student attendance at Stuckey Middle School um, in terms of like, like you know, if the, you know, declining enrollment um, and things like that? Yeah. So uh, as we're looking, uh, obviously we're gonna have to take uh, some students out of Stuckey that will now occupy Isley. Um, currently, um, when we looked at the data, there were 215 sixth through eighth graders that live um, in the impacted boundary area, the, the, what, what is now going to be the new Isley boundary, uh, which is the area in the red, um, that area um, east of Oliver. And um, of those 215, 118 are actually at Stuckey. So if we were to convert it today and make the change today, Stuckey would decline enrollment by 118 students. Now, I, I will say we've, this, this has been a topic of discussions uh, for us because we need, we need to grow Stuckey. And so we felt that by us growing and by us starting with sixth grade next year, going to seventh and eighth grade, it would give us some time uh, to brainstorm and to, to find some, some ways uh, for for us to get more students to Stucky Middle School. Kathy? Oh, I'm sorry, Nock, were you done? Okay, Kathy? I want to piggyback off of what Nock said about um, we could amend this plan for Isley and put maybe to build an annex or to build a, a room. And how many families, how many students are there in mixed abilities at Isley? There's, it's four classrooms currently. I, I don't know three, that off the top of my head. Three. It was four under Esser, so they've actually already gone from four to three. Okay. Um, classrooms? Yes. Okay. So we had four, there were four uh, mixed abilities classrooms at Isley with Esser dollars because Esser went away. We had to make some changes, so now they're at three. So there's three mixed abilities classrooms, there's three PBS classrooms, there's a visually impaired classroom, there's a gifted classroom, and then there's two pre K classrooms when you think of specialized programs think about programs all schools don't have right um, to Kelly's point earlier um, we don't we don't have any elementary school with as many specialized programs as Isley has 
Um, and that was a choice made because there was space at Isley. Um, we've pulled the maps. We've written in, okay, we're going to need this many for math. We're going to need this many for English. We're going to need this many for the art teacher. We're going to need this many. And so we know how much exact space we need. Um, there's 11 classrooms currently occupied with a specialized program of some kind at Isley. We need at least six of those for to house the middle school. And that's changing some of where everything is. So it, it's not a great, it's not ideal, but it's also a, a numbers game. Mm -hmm. You can't add those mm -hmm. and keep everything. And it's, again, it's, it's not ideal, but you can't keep, we can't keep everything. Right. And then it just becomes about what do you choose? Right. And how did the administration get to that point of what to choose? And just the number of classrooms, I think. Is just the number fair? of classrooms? Yeah. So there's those Is two uh -huh. create six. And that, and that would be another, another question for you all. If mm -hmm. you want to amend a master plan, um, what about the positive behavior support mm -hmm. classrooms? Because we haven't heard advocates from that, but that, that's another decision we'd have to make. Um, right. And just because we haven't heard from advocates, do we make a different decision? Um, that, again, that, we would need to do some analysis before I came back with the recommendation, but you know, it, like I said, it, it is your plan. If it's the will of the board, you know, to, to pivot, we can. I, I will share, it is not uncommon for programs to be moved and, and to change. Um, they, it does happen, and it's happened many times over the years. Um, again, the other part that we also, I mean, we do have buildings that have room. There's other schools that have room. I mean, that's part of the, the master plan and the exercise that we went through last year also. So then why couldn't we move a different program from Isley to those buildings and keep mixed abilities at Isley since we have had advocates from this area? Like you said, we haven't had any from PBS, that, so, but we've had them from these people and their voices have been heard. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, is that a something to consider for the board to say, well, well you it's, know. It, again, it's not a, a I'm sorry, placement I'm sorry. of the programs. It's not I a for, board forgive decision. Forgive me. So. You're right. It's just the boundary. Yeah. So let me give you some ideas to take back to your people. Um, is there another consideration of perhaps maybe moving PBS to the buildings that you would be moving the mixed abilities at Isley to and let them stay? Is that so an that option? You, just so we're clear, both mixed abilities and PBS would be moving out of Isley. That's, that's what, cur what is the current plan. So what is staying? The, the visually impaired. Visually uh, impaired, gifted, gifted. pre-K. So yes, we, we, we feel like we're bringing you our, the best recommendation mm -hmm. based on the information we have. We, could we have put, chosen pre-K? Yeah, yes, we could have chosen pre-K. Could we have chosen visually impaired? Yes. We could have chosen different programs. We're bringing you what we feel is the best recommendation. So, thank you. Um, this, since this is just the boundary changes, the further discussions uh, of changing the master plan obviously uh, would be down the road. So, uh, I move that we take the recommended action on the Isley K-8 transition plan and boundary change. Uh, moved by Stan, second by Melody. You may vote. Motion carries 4-1 with Knock voting against it. And obviously we have one member missing tonight. Oh, uh, Kathy, did you abstain? Okay, so that's a no vote. So uh, it passes four to two. Thank you for catching that. Uh, next item, please. Miscellaneous superintendent's report. Kelly. All right, I'm just going to uh, look forward. First off, well, I'll look backward real quickly. Uh, thank you guys for coming out and seeing some great teaching 
uh, last week. That was a lot of fun, and I think hopefully tied in some, some things that you voted for, some decisions you made, and how it aligns. Um, looking uh, forward, I've uh, got a couple exciting things coming up. We have JROTC uh, uh, Veterans Day Assembly on Thursday. Um, that is at WSU um, at the auxiliary gym at Coke Arena. So um, new location, just make sure you have that on your calendar, 10.30 start time. Uh, and then next week we have um, the Literacy Summit. So please share that uh, with, with everyone you know. Um, we hope to get a lot of uh, engagement and talk uh, discussion about literacy, um, all the great things we're doing as a district. Um, and then following that, I believe we are a go on November 18th for the workshop about the cell phone policy. Um, so we're going to meet, uh, that'll be at AMAC, and just a workshop, so no action taken, but we'll, we'll have that meeting coming up uh, before Thanksgiving. So the intention of that meeting is really going to be to look at some feedback from administrators. Uh, you know, when, when you all voted on the policy change last year, the school year had already started. So now that we've started a, a new school year with the policy in place, Here's some feedback on uh, what they think, how it's going. Um, we may look a little bit at the recommendations from the Blue Ribbon Task Force from KSDE and what they have said. Um, and really just a chance to kind of hear and process, uh, do we, what, what's next with that policy? Is there, is there a desire to, to make uh, continued revisions or is there a desire to leave it as is? So, um, and then, uh, then, we'll, then it'll be Thanksgiving break. So, uh, and then our next board meeting right after that. So that's all I have for my report. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, Latonia, next item, please. New business and Board of Education requests. Are there any new business or Board of Education requests? Next item, please. Executive session personnel matters for non-elected personnel. Diane. I move that the board go into executive session for discussing personnel matters for non-elected personnel to protect the privacy interests of an identifiable individual for 10 minutes following a five minute break. The executive session will include all the board members present and the general counsel, Dan Lawrence, and Superintendent Kelly Bielefeld. The open meeting will resume here in the boardroom at? 8.52. At 8.52. Second. Moved by Diane and second by Stan to go into executive session. You may vote. Motion. Motion carries 6-0. We'll be back at 8.52. We are now back in order from executive session. No action taken. No vote needed. Uh, Latonia, next item, please. Adjournment. I move that we adjourn. I second. Moved by Diane, second by Kathy to adjour adjourn. You may vote. Motion carries 6-0. We'll see you in December. <laughs>